dozen men dressed only in towels around their waists mingled about, appraising the women. Burkhart was one of them. He stood near a bank of orchids, behind it, actually. The towel they'd given him was barely enough to cover his massive physique, and he was holding on to both ends of it for dear life. Maddie couldn't help it. She started laughing. Don't slip, she said. You could have stayed in the car. Made this much easier, Burkhart shot back. And miss the expression on your face? A tall blonde woman with large natural breasts strolled up to them. She put her ruby fingernails on Burkhart's chest, looked at Maddie, and said in a Hungarian accent, Is the rest of him as big? Maddie fought off a smile. I wouldn't know. The blonde's eyes sparkled. First date and you agree to come to paradise? You must be sexy, girl. So you want to party with Michelle? Chapter 80 My friends, fellow Berliners, cruising at 130 kilometers an hour, I should make it home to my city of scars just in time for a late afternoon appointment I cannot afford to miss. I yawn. It took me more than an hour and a half to reach the train station and ride back to the auto show. But the Mercedes was right where I left it, far from the police sure to be jamming hall number one. I've been driving ever since, and I confess I'm tired. I should pull over and sleep, my friends. But there is so much left to do before I can even think of resting. So I reach in the glove compartment and get out a bottle of amphetamines. I take two, think about it, and then down another. I turn on the radio and listen to descriptions of Arthur Yeager's murder and the chase on the Autobahn. They've found the Maserati and are taking DNA samples from it. It doesn't bother me. There's nothing that can match me to the car. As the uppers kick in, I glance over at the folder on the seat beside me. I open it and turn over the picture of Arthur and his mother from his archived file. Beneath it is a picture of two girls, one nine, one six. They're hugging each other. Ilona and Ilse. I'd tried every trick I knew to get Ilsa to tell me where Ilona lived, but she refused right up until the end. The only thing she'd tell me was that Ilona was mentally ill and a methadone addict because of me. And then it hits me. Methadone addict. It means she has a license. It means Ilona goes to a clinic. She can be found. She can die tonight, if I'm lucky, and with her almost all my secrets. Ilona Fry, I muse. Ilona. I glance at the photo. Such a name someone gave you. Ilona. What did your name used to be? No matter. I'd remember you no matter what they called you. You looked so very much like your younger sister, not like your mother at all. Chapter 81 Burkhardt and Maddie followed Michelle as she sashayed down a hallway at the Paradise FKK. There were doors on both sides. Where are we going? Maddie asked, feeling uneasy. To talk to Genevieve, Michelle said as she rounded a corner. Maddie followed reluctantly with Burkhardt walking beside her, still clutching his towel. Set against the walls of the hall and between the doors were gilded sofas with deep purple velvet upholstery. On one couch, a naked woman's head bobbed in the lap of a man whose eyes were closed. They're doing it in public? Maddie whispered sharply at Burkhart. He sputtered, It's not my idea of fun. Michelle, meanwhile, went to the last door on the right, rapped loudly, and said, It's Michelle, Genevieve. Please stop what you're doing and tell your client he will incur no charges for time spent. A moment later, an irate Italian man appeared in the doorway and started to abrade Michelle for the interruption. Burkhart stepped forward, towering over the guy, and told him to hit the showers. The man hesitated but then stormed away, railing in Italian. 
Genevieve, a beautiful young woman from Guadalupe with smooth cocoa skin and long, wavy hair, came to the door. I'm out a hundred and fifty euros, Genevieve complained. We'll compensate you for your time, Maddie assured her. Genevieve squinted and studied her. Who are you? Michelle said, Perhaps we'd better go inside. Genevieve shrugged and turned into the room, which was small and filled almost entirely with a bed. The walls were mirrors. So was the ceiling. There were reflections of the two naked women, Maddie and Burkhardt, at every angle. Michelle introduced the private investigators and told Genevieve that they were here to find out what happened to Ilza Fry and to Chris Schneider. Reluctantly, Genevieve agreed to talk. She corroborated much of what Tina Hanover had told them, but with more detail. She said that she was in the women's locker room two weeks before, when Ilza ran in shaking and crying. Ilza told Genevieve that she had just overheard a customer talking to one of the other girls in the lounge. Ilza said she did not know him by sight, Genevieve said. He looked completely different than she remembered him, but she thought she knew his voice. Why? Maddie asked. Whose voice was it? Genevieve bit her lip before replying. Ilza said she thought he may have been the man who killed her mother. Maddie absorbed that, her mind wanting to leap in a dozen directions, but she reined it in when Burkhardt said, But she wasn't sure? She was pretty sure, Genevieve allowed. But when we went back upstairs together to try to hear him again, he was gone. Maddie groaned. So you can't identify him? Perplexed, Genevieve looked at Michelle, who said, If he's the punter we think he is, he's been here six or seven times in the past few years. So you know what he looks like? Maddie said, excited. Not exactly, Michelle cautioned. What does that mean? Burkhardt said. We think it's the same guy, Michelle explained. But he looks different every time he comes in. Sometimes he's blonde and blue-eyed, other times brown with dark hair, his eyebrows, his cheeks. One time his hair was slicked back like a helmet. Another time he wore a devil's beard and... Genevieve interrupted. He was green-eyed and red-headed last week when I saw him, about eight days after Ilse disappeared. Genevieve was openly agitated by the memory. He's a freak, you know? He likes to make you feel threatened. Gets off on it. He give you a name? Genevieve's eyes flashed darkly. That night he called himself the Invisible Man. Michelle nodded grimly. But we all call him the Mask. Chapter 82 Aboard Private's corporate jet, returning to Berlin two hours later, Maddie finally got up the nerve to call Katerina Doric. She answered in an infuriated rave. You hung up on me? Calm down, Maddie said. We've made a break, a big one. I don't care, Katerina shouted. Where are you? On the jet. We'll land in half an hour. Katerina fumed. You didn't talk to Frankfurt Crippo? We'll do it by phone, Maddie said. We, uh, Burkhardt and I, felt like we needed to get back to Berlin ASAP. That makes you a fugitive. Maddie had had enough. Only if we don't catch the bastard who killed Chris and Ilza Fry and Arthur Jaeger and who knows how many others. That silenced Private Berlin's managing investigator for several moments before she said in a hoarse, barely controlled voice, What did you find? Maddie gave Katerina a wrap-up of their trips to Ilza Fry's home and the Paradise FKK, including the vague description she'd gotten of the mask man. Did you show them pictures of Hermann Kruger or Maxim Pavel? she demanded. Both, Maddie said. They said they couldn't be sure in either case, because the only reason they know it's one guy coming back is the fact that he always shows up with a new mask. So, what, he's an art collector like Kruger? Katerina asked. They didn't know, but one of the women said he knew everything about the mask he wore while they had sex. It's called a Chukwe tribal mask. She says it was leather and ebony and ivory and depicts a monster. My money's on Kruger, Katerina said. High Commissar Dietrich thinks it's him as well. He called here looking for you about an hour ago. 
Berlin Crippo found a gun in the trunk of one of Kruger's cars this morning. Ballistics tests show it's the same forty caliber that killed Agnes. They're preparing an arrest warrant, but I'll call Rudy Kruger, see if his stepfather collected masks. Good idea, Maddie replied, then asked Katerina to tell Dr. Gabrielle that Ilona Fry had been in and out of mental facilities and was a methadone addict. She also told Katerina about their suspicions regarding the son of the man named Falk, who'd run the slaughterhouse. After Katerina promised to start running those leads down, Maddie called her Aunt Cecilia to warn her that it was going to be another late night. Maddie felt a few moments of guilt at not spending time with Nicholas. But she told herself that it was justified. Nicholas wanted to know who killed Chris as much as she did. Maddie hung up just as the pilot came on over the intercom to tell them they were in their initial approach to Berlin and to turn off all electronic devices. She looked over at Burkhart, who turned off his iPad. Any luck? she asked. Burkhart nodded as he slid it into a neoprene sleeve. There's a professor at Potsdam, I found, an expert on masks and primitive art. He's roughly the right age, and there are several galleries in the city that specialize in primitive art. I'm thinking that if our boy is a serious collector, they just might know him. Chapter 83 They landed during a sunset that made the skies over Berlin look bruised. At least to Maddie, who immediately began making calls on her cell phone while Burkhart went to retrieve the car. The line of Franz Hellemann, the art professor at Potsdam University, went directly to a voicemail prompt. She hesitated and then decided not to leave him a message. It would be better to talk with him face to face in the morning. She called two of the art galleries Burkhardt had found and got recordings that listed their addresses and hours of operation. She looked at the third number and address and realized that the I. M. Ehrlichman Gallery was just south of Savignyplatz on Schluderstrasse, not far from where Agnes Kruger had died. Let's swing by this place on the way to the office, she told Burkhardt. They were outside the I. M. Ehrlichman Gallery in less than ten minutes, only to find a man lowering metal grate security gates on the establishment. Hello, Maddie called. I'm closed he said, and turned, revealing a trim, academic-looking man with black-framed glasses, close-cropped salt-and-pepper hair, and a tweed jacket and tie. He blinked at Maddie, and then glanced up at Burkhart. You're a big fellow. Burkhart nodded. He showed the man his badge, identified himself, and said, This is Maddie Engel. We work for Private Berlin. Isaac Ehrlichman, the man said agreeably. But my gallery is closed. We were hoping you could help us, Maddie said. Tomorrow I would be glad to, the gallery owner said. But I have a dinner engagement to attend. A birthday dinner, actually. My lady friends. Just one question, Maddie insisted. Ehrlichman sighed. One question. Is Hermann Kruger a collector of masks? Have you sold any to him? That falls under client privilege, I'm afraid. And that's two questions. You know he's under suspicion in his wife's murder, Burkhart asked. That's your third question, and I did read about that in the paper, yes. This could be part of it, Herr Ehrlichman, Maddie said. Please, off the record, does Kruger collect masks? If he doesn't, we're on our way. The gallery owner checked his watch, going through some inner struggle before replying. Herr Kruger has bought many masks from me over the years. Any recently? Burkhardt asked. Ehrlichman paused and then nodded. As a matter of fact, early last week, he bought a valuable Chukwe tribal mask. Chapter 84 Forty minutes later, the Chukwe mask showed on the big screen in the amphitheater at Private Berlin. Before hurrying off to his dinner engagement, Isaac Ehrlichman had told them where to find a digital photo of the mask in his online catalog and promised to make himself available to them in the morning. Jack Morgan had ordered takeout food and the entire Private Berlin staff and Daniel Brecht were in the amphitheater eating. Morgan sat next to Maddie and studied the mask skeptically. So let me get this straight, he said. Hermann Kruger goes to brothels in disguise and then wears these masks while having sex? 
That's evidently the long, strange journey he's on, Maddie replied. And I thought L.A. was the world capital of Twisted. Maddie laughed. Berlin will definitely give L.A. a run for its money. What about Pavel? Does he have any interest in masks? No idea, Brecht answered. He hasn't surfaced in more than two days now. But I'm predicting he makes an appearance about an hour or two after Berlin's game tomorrow night. Why? We're setting up a little surprise for him, said Morgan cryptically. Staring once again at the Chuckway mask, Maddie felt lingering doubt. Did Hermann Kruger kill Chris, his wife, and the others? Or could Pavel be somehow involved? Were they in on it together, and where were they? Maddie said, I can't believe Interpol can't find Kruger. They'll find him, Katerina Doric said. You can't hide a billionaire for long, especially when his stock's taking such a beating. In the meantime, call Frankfurt Crippo and give them a statement. Dr. Gabrielle's phone rang. He answered it. So, Burkhardt, Brecht said, explain again how he got away from you. Maddie laughed and said, the story of the skimpy towel he had to wear at the FKK club is better. Burkhardt frowned at her. I thought we had an understanding about that. Maddie tried to swallow her grin. I couldn't resist. It was just so classic. Maddie, Katerina said. Frankfurt Crippo? Maddie sighed and nodded. But then Dr. Gabriel hung up his phone and said, I've got the sister, Ilona Fry. She is a registered methadone addict, and she lives in vetting. Chapter 85 The air had warmed during the break in the storm, and a mix of recent immigrants and low-income workers was out strolling the streets of vetting, northeast of the Berlin Technical University, when Burkhardt turned on to Amsterdamerstrasse, where Ilona Fry lived in a government-subsidized apartment on the second floor of a shambles of a building. They parked, climbed a front stoop blackened with grime, and found the front door unlocked. Rap dueled with Middle Eastern music as they ascended a bare wooden staircase to a second floor that smelled of jasmine and curry. Maddie heard an infant squalling with the distinctive rattle of colic, and her mind flashed back to Nicholas as a five-month-old racked with the affliction. She felt instant pity for the poor woman who must care for the child. Maddie had had no husband while raising Nicholas as a baby, but she'd had Aunt C and her mother, and that had saved her. Maddie, Burkhardt said, startling her from her thoughts. Maddie blinked, surprised to find herself stopped in the hallway, looking at the door to the apartment where the infant was crying and coughing. Sorry, Maddie said, feeling slightly bewildered and suddenly more tired than she thought possible. What number is she? She asked, yawning. Burkhart gestured toward the far end of the hall. 27. They'd no sooner passed apartment 25, a mere 10 feet from Ilona Fry's door, than they heard a woman shrieking in abject terror. Chapter 86 At the first scream... I spin and leap down the fire escape and reach the ladder just as the screeching turns hysterical. I hear pounding and yelling mixed with the screaming as I swing off the ladder and then land in the alley behind the apartment building where Ilona Fry lives. I sprint away. People are yelling from windows above me, but I'm wearing a simple black ski mask. No one has seen me. The real me, I'm sure. Approaching the mouth of the alley where it gives way to Terina Strasse, I tear the mask off, stick it in my back pocket, and force myself to step out slowly and deliberately, and I continue down the sidewalk. From there, with all the traffic, I can't hear the screaming at all. I tear off the dark anorak as I move, revealing a bright yellow jogging coat with reflectors. My heart is racing and I'm berating myself for being so bold, so cocky, after so many years of careful movement. I never should have attempted to use the fire escape to reach her apartment. I should have slowed down, watched her, and patterned her movements. But I no longer have the luxury of time. On what was supposed to be a scouting mission, I spotted the fire escape leading up past an open window of what had to be her apartment. 
I'd glanced around, seen no one in the alley, and opted for a quick, improvised plan. I pulled the mask on. I started climbing. When I reached the landing, I squatted there a moment and then slipped to the window. My old and dear friend Ilona had been right there, right in the hallway of her apartment with her back to me. I couldn't help it. My throat clicked in that way it does when I'm pleased. She must have heard it, because she twisted, saw me, and screamed. Now I start to jog toward Schiller Park. When I reach it, I dump the anorak in the first trash can. Then I keep jogging, figuring that I'll go thirty minutes or so before looping back to the Mercedes. Stay calm, I tell myself. You know where she lives, and she's an addict. My friends, we know exactly where she'll be come morning, don't we? Hmm. Chapter 87 as the shrieking intensified, Maddie pounded on Ilona Fry's door and shouted, Frau Fry? Ilona Fry? That one, said a woman's voice. She crazy. She stood in the doorway of apartment 25, a disgusted old Vietnamese woman wearing a maroon scarf on her head. She always screaming and crying about ghosts and something. Crazy. The screaming inside had turned into hysterical sobs. Stand back, Maddie, Burkhardt ordered. Maddie got out of his way. Pistol drawn, Burkhart hurled his weight against the door. The jam splintered and the door blew open. They followed the sound of the woman sobbing. No, no, God, no, please, Falk, please. At the mention of Falk, Maddie ran past Burkhart into a bedroom that featured a mattress, a few blankets, and a lamp burning a naked bulb. The same disheveled woman Maddie had seen on video embracing Chris in Private Berlin's lobby the week before he died was now rammed into the deepest corner of the room. Ilona Fry's hands were wrapped tightly around her head as if to protect it from a beating. No, she moaned. No, fuck, no. We're not here to hurt you, Ilona, Maddie said softly, walking to her slowly. We're here to help you. Ilona Fry blinked through her tears and began to whimper. No, please, I, I want to stay here. I'm taking my meds, I promise you. There was someone at the hallway window. He wore a mask. I promise you, don't take me away again. We won't take you anywhere you don't want to go, Maddie soothed. Ilona Fry panted and sweated like a wild woman, but Maddie's tone of assurance caused her to lower her arms. She spotted Burkhardt and pressed backward in fear. In her mind, Maddie heard Frau Leidwisch telling her that all of the children who arrived at Weisenhaus 44 on the night of February 12, 1980, feared men. She looked at Burkhardt. Do me a favor. Check the hallway window and that fire escape, and then hang outside. Burkhardt squinted, but then he nodded. When he'd gone, Maddie turned back and said, We're friends of Chris Schneider's, Ilona. We worked with him at Private Berlin. Something unknotted in Ilona Fry at that point, and she peered at Maddie as if she were a distant light in a fog. Christoph? Maddie sat on the bare floor next to her. The man you went to see at Private Berlin a couple weeks ago. The boy you lived with at Weisenhaus 44. Ilona Fry wiped her tear-streaked face and choked. Where is he? He was supposed to come to see me and tell me he'd found my sister. Maddie sighed and said, Chris is dead, Ilona. At that, Ilona Fry began to hyperventilate. She began to scratch at her wrists, whining, No, no, please tell me that's not true. I'm sorry, but it is true. He died last week. Ilona Fry lowered her head and began to weep. How? Oh. Chris was murdered, Ilona. I found his body in a slaughterhouse in... <gasps> no! Ilona gasped before her entire body went seizure stiff and trembling. Her lips rippled with terror as she said, Not there. Not the slaughterhouse. Oh, God, not there. She tried to get up, but then doubled over on her knees and retched. Maddie was completely upended by Ilona Fry's reaction. 
But while the poor woman dry heaved and choked, Maddie got to her feet, and in the bathroom she found a threadbare towel that she wetted in the sink. She returned to the bedroom to find Alona Fry slumped against the wall, looking like she'd been punched and kicked into dumbness. Maddie wiped at the sweat on Alona's brow and daubed away the mucus lingering at the corners of her mouth, saying, What do you know about the slaughterhouse, Ilona? But Ilona Fry said nothing as she stared off into space, her mouth first loose and agape and then tightening as she began to weep. He said he'd kill us if we talked, and here he's killed Chris and he was here to kill me. She hunched over and sobbed. Maddie reached out and brought Ilona into her arms, feeling her agony pulse through her. When her crying slowed, Maddie asked again, What do you know about the slaughterhouse, Ilona? At last, shuddering at the burden, Ilona Fry whispered, I know everything about the slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. Everything. Book Four The Mask Chapter 88 An hour later, Maddie sat in a state of shock on a rickety chair across a small table from Ilona Fry as she wound down her terrible story. Rung out from the telling, Ilona Fry's voice had gone hoarse when she said, That was the afternoon before the men came and took us to Weisenhaus 44. It was also the last time I saw the slaughterhouse or Falk. I wanted to forget it, and forget everything that had happened there. I could not get myself to go back later and look at it, never. And for Chris to have gone in there and... She threw up her hands and fought back tears. Maddie had been involved in police work for most of her adult life, and had cynically believed she'd heard every sort of brutal tale there was to tell. But none was even remotely like the horrific story she'd just heard, and for several moments she could not utter a word. A heavy silence seized the room. Ilona Fry studied Maddie, tears seeping past the corners of her mouth as she gripped her arms tightly. I've never told anyone about the slaughterhouse. You two are the first. Maddie glanced at Burkhardt, who stood in the doorway looking skeptical. She knew instantly what he was thinking. Ilona Fry was a schizophrenic, a narcotics addict. How much of what they'd just heard was real? and how much of it was an invention of her disturbed mind. Burkhardt had checked the fire escape and the alley, but he'd seen nothing that could corroborate Ilona Fry's claim that a man had been outside her window, which had increased his skepticism. But then Maddie thought of Chris's nightmares, and that haunted space he used to shield inside him. If Ilona Fry's story was true, it was certainly a big enough trauma to create a festering wound in even the strongest of men. Why was this never reported to the authorities? asked Burkhardt. Why didn't you tell your doctors? Falk said he'd kill us, Ilona Fry said. We believed him. I believed him. And tonight he was true to his word, wasn't he? Did Greta Amsel believe him? Burkhardt asked. Ilona Fry pushed her hair back from her face. Greta? Why Greta? She's dead too, Ilona, Maddie said sadly. And Artur. Ilona Fry's lips stretched wide, and her body began to sway and contort, as if something were racking her muscles. Then Ilza's dead too, isn't she? Maddie's mind flashed on the image of the woman's corpse in the sub-basement of the slaughterhouse, but she did not have the heart to tell her. We don't know. He's killed her, and he's going to kill me, Ilona Fry whined. That was him at the window. Of course it was. I'm one of the last. He's got to kill me. We are not going to let that happen, Maddie said, reaching across for her hand. Just calm down. We talked to one of the girls who worked with your sister. She said Ilza heard him speak where she worked. Is that right? Ilona Fry hugged herself, shivering as she nodded. Falk has a distinctive voice. He makes these clicking noises in his throat when he's pleased and he likes to finish sentences with this hum that rises to a question. Hmm. But that was 30 years ago, Burkhardt said. How could she be sure? Ilona Fry glared at him. You don't forget someone like Falk. He's burned into your brain. 
Was that why you came to our office? To tell Chris that Falk was alive and Ilza was missing? Maddie asked. I was petrified, Ilona explained. Chris was the only person I could turn to, the only one I knew who would believe me and could do something about it. Burkhart said, So Chris investigates, finds out it's true that Falk's alive. He tracks Falk down and follows him to the slaughterhouse. And Falk kills him, Maddie said dully, feeling the haunted space in her own heart growing with every tortured beat. Chapter 89 My friends, my fellow Berliners, at this moment I'm sitting behind the wheel and tinted windows of my old Trabant 601 sedan. Do you know the Trabant? The worker's car? No matter. My well-maintained Trabi is parked on Amsterdamer Strasse, south of Ilona Frey's apartment building. I've been here almost half an hour, and I'm starting to shiver in my sweaty clothes. No police, I think. That's good. A neighbor was probably in the hallway when I was on the fire escape, heard her scream, and... I suddenly want to break something. No, I want to shatter it. No, pulverize it into dust. My friends... Matty Engel and Tom Burkhart just came out the front door of the apartment building, and they're flanking Ilona Fry. They walk away from me, heading north, and instantly my confidence feels like it's suffered a thousand razor cuts. Has she talked? Will they believe her? No. No, I tell myself. Ilona Fry is certifiably insane. The state says so. She hears voices. She has other personalities. She's a registered opiate freak, for God's sake! Even so, there's an impulse shooting through me right now that wants to start the trabby, haul ass down the street, and shoot them all dead. Right there on the sidewalk, or in that BMW they're climbing into. A moment later, they pull out, still heading north. I wait a few moments, cool down, and ultimately decide not to follow them. I think I know where they might end up eventually tonight. I'll go there. I'll be invisible. I'll wait for my chance to strike. Chapter 90 Twenty minutes later, Maddie walked up to her own apartment door. Ilona Fry shuffled along uncertainly behind her, with Burkhart bringing up the rear. As she fumbled for her keys, the odor of sautéed onions and meat came to her. So did Niklas's voice as he chattered to Aunt C about the possibility of Hertha Berlin and Cassiano becoming champions of the second division. You don't want somebody like me staying with your family, Ilona Fry said somberly. Especially if you've got kids. I might... You might be surprised, Maddie said. In any case, you're not staying anywhere else until this is over. I need my meds in the morning. Ilona said, scratching at her arms. We can arrange that, Maddie said, and she unlocked and opened her door. Ilona Fry followed Maddie into the apartment in a slow trudge. Burkhart closed the door behind him and turned the deadbolts. As Maddie knew she would, her aunt Cecilia welcomed Ilona Fry like an old friend caught in a storm. Have you eaten? she asked. Smells real good, Burkhart said, sniffing the air as Ilona shook her head. It was good, Tom, Nicholas announced after hugging his mother hello. Maultagen with venison and onion stuffing, Aunt C said, moving toward the kitchen. But the noodles are already cold. I'll fry them and you can have them with sour cream and a beer, yeah? Uh, yeah, Burkhardt said, rubbing at his stomach. Ilona Fry still looked lost, and Maddie was trying to figure out what she could say to set the woman at some ease when Socrates pranced into the room. Chris's cat went straight to Ilona and rubbed against her legs. That's Socrates, Nicholas said, reappraising the woman his mother had brought home to a late dinner. He doesn't usually like new people. Maddie shook her head, saying, it's true. He was Chris's. Socrates purred loudly and contentedly until a weak but growing smile crossed Ilona Fry's face. She bent down and picked up the cat. She sat in one of the chairs and rubbed Socrates' belly as Nicholas surged again into a high-spirited explanation of why Cassiano was such a great striker. Nicholas's argument was directed at Burkhart, who listened attentively and in total agreement, 
while Maddie helped her aunt fry the stuffed pasta crispy and golden. Burkhart praised the fried maultajan as the best he'd ever had after eating the last one in the bowl. Ilona Fry ate only one, but she agreed with Burkhart's assessment of the meal, which pleased Aunt Cecilia to no end. After clearing the plates, Burkhart said to Maddie, If you'll give me a blanket and a pillow, I'll sleep on the couch tonight. Maddie frowned. That's not... It is necessary, Burkhart said firmly. She's one of the last two. Last two of what? Nicholas asked. Ilona Fry looked upset, and Socrates jumped off her lap. She's one of the last two really nice ladies we know, Maddie said quickly, irritated with Burkhart. Now off to bed, you. I'll be in to say goodnight in a minute. Chapter 91 Maddie kept her irritation in check until Aunt C had taken Alona Fry to show her where she could sleep, and she'd heard Nicholas's bedroom door shut. She crossed her arms and faced the counterterrorism expert. I try to shield Nicholas as much as I can from what I do. I don't want to explain all the murders to him. It will frighten him. He's only nine. Burkhart's face fell. You mean my line about Ilona being one of the two left? Maddie nodded. He's smart, but he's also very sensitive. I apologize, Burkhart said sincerely. It won't happen again. He paused. He's a good kid, you know. You're doing something very right with him. Maddie softened. Thank you, Burkhart. It's nice of you to say so. He hesitated. His dad in the picture? She didn't know whether she wanted to respond, but said, No, Nicholas's father was someone inconsequential in my life, an ill-considered fling that became the miracle that is my son. He wanted no part of Nicholas, and I, frankly, wanted no part of him. So you raised him alone? Burkhart said. That's impressive, considering. Aunt C and my mother helped until she passed, Maddie said, feeling defensive. And considering what? Well, the job, of course. I know how demanding it can be. Maddie's shoulders fell. You don't know the half of it. Tell me, Burkhart said. She studied him, wondering whether to explain or let it lie. Something about his compassionate expression made her decision. I lost my position at Crippo because I refused to compromise when it came to Nicholas, Maddie said. I won't bore you with the details, but one night when I should have been at a murder scene, I was instead home with him. He was very ill, a horrible cough and fever. For that, I was transferred to the press office and away from investigations. I sued the force. I lost. Burkhart's eyebrows rose. Is that what Dietrich meant when he first came on the case and said something about your reputation preceding you? Maddie's cheeks reddened. Yes, I expect so. And speaking of the Hauptkommissar, I think it's time to tell him everything that happened today. Aunt C came into the living room with a blanket and pillows. You sure you'll be comfortable on that couch? Your legs will hang off. Burkhart grinned and took the bedding from her. I'll be fine. Good night, Burkhart, Maddie said. And thank you for staying. I wouldn't have it any other way. Chapter 92 The moon was near full and glowed through a vent in the storm, casting Treptor Park in a pale light that threw dark shadows past the statues of the kneeling Russian soldiers. High Commissar Dietrich sat bow-backed amid those shadows on the stone steps of the memorial. He was drinking from a bottle of vodka and staring blearily out over the graves of Stalin's men toward the silhouette of the great Soviet warrior carrying the German child. Dietrich was recalling how he'd come here as a boy shortly after his mother's death from pneumonia. He'd been no more than six or seven. The colonel had brought him to these very steps. His father had pointed across the graves toward the huge statue, saying, Your mother is now like the heroes buried here, Hans. And you, you are like that child cradled in the soldier's arms. Do you understand? Dietrich had not understood. At that moment, he had felt only confusion and loss. And yet he had nodded at the colonel for fear of disappointing him. Sitting there in Treptower Park some forty-odd years later, the High Commissar felt the same emotions whirl through him, and anger, and desperation, and... His cell phone rang. 
He thought about ignoring it, but then dug it from the pocket of his coat. Dietrich. Hi, Commissar, Maddie said. It's... I know who this is, Dietrich grumbled. Weigel called me two hours ago. She informed me of the murder of Herr Jaeger and the fact that you and Herr Burkhardt are wanted in Frankfurt on charges of grand theft auto and for questioning in regards to that murder. It's irrelevant. We know who the killer is, High Commissar, Maddie said. Dietrich's head snapped back. Hermann Kruger? he asked, feeling much drunker than he had not a minute ago. No, Maddie said firmly. His name is Falk. No first name yet. He's the son of the man who ran the slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. Have you been drinking again, sir? I have, Dietrich acknowledged. I buried my father today. My last family. There was a silence on the phone before Maddie said, I am sorry, sir. Should I take this information to Inspector Weigel? A war erupted inside the High Commissar, part of him wanting to push it all Weigel's way but his insatiable curiosity got the better of him. No. Tell me. Clouds closed in on the moon, leaving Dietrich and the war memorial in darkness, save a saber of dim light that cut across the statue of the Soviet, as Maddie gave him a thumbnail report on their actions in Frankfurt on Main and a rough outline of Ilona Fry's story. As she spoke on, bile crept up and burned the high commissar's throat. When she finished, Dietrich felt weak, almost disjointed, almost like a marionette clipped of strings, and he hunched over his bottle. He was silent for many moments, his drunken mind reeling, trying to think through the implications of the tale. He saw several lines of possible inquiry that he did not like, not one bit. Despite his pride, his ethics, and his devotion to duty at Berlin Kripo, the High Commissar began to think openly in a different manner, one that was more extremely self-interested. Hi, Commissar, Maddie said. Are you there? Finally, Dietrich cleared his throat and said, Your sources are prostitutes and a schizophrenic methadone addict. Is that correct? Yes, Maddie said, again defensive. But I believe them. The High Commissar laughed scornfully. That's why you work for private, and I still work for Berlin Kripo. As a public servant, I have to take sources into account when I'm judging where to put my manpower. Greta Amsel is dead, Maddie insisted. I was an eyewitness to Arthur Jaeger's murder, and I think that body with Chris's was Ilza Fry's. Agnes Kruger is dead too, Dietrich shot back, and I'm beginning to believe Hermann killed Chris and the others. No, that's something different, I think. Is it? Seems more likely than some crazy story about the slaughterhouse and a boogeyman named Falk. Maybe Kruger is Falk, Maddie said. Or Pavel is Falk. Dietrich gritted his teeth. Perhaps. I'll ask them. Maddie's voice came back bitter. You're saying you won't talk to Ilona? Hear her entire story firsthand? Dietrich felt stronger now, charting his own way. I will, in due course, Frau Engel. Meanwhile, my time will be best spent hunting for Hermann Kruger. The High Commissar stabbed the end button on his phone, and the moon fell full victim to the clouds, leaving the war memorial grounds so pitch black that Dietrich thought for a moment he'd been blinded. Chapter 93 I confess, friends and fellow Berliners, that I've been drinking absinthe, the green fairy, since midnight. Ordinarily, I don't indulge in any sort of intoxicant, but for the first time I truly understand what it must be like to have escaped prison with dogs baying behind me. The green fairy's the only thing stopping me from panicked flight. The instinct is, of course, to run and run hard. My drunken heart races at the idea I might have to abandon my life and disappear into yet another mask. But I've done so much to craft this one, as carefully as the masks that line the walls of the room where I'm drinking absinthe and brooding. My mind feels sullen and foggy 
and I keep seeing myself sitting down the street from Matty Engel's apartment building, waiting for Tom Burkhardt to leave. But he did not leave. The lights in her place went off with him inside, and me filled with a sudden and intense longing for the green distillation I'm using to deaden my growing agitation. What did Ilona tell Engel and Burkhardt? It doesn't matter. An insane woman's ravings, that's what they'll think. Unless they find Kiefer Braun. But I've been using every search engine at my disposal. I've even hired several tracking services and there's no trace of him. Maybe my dear old friend Kiefer just decided to disappear into another life, as I did. Or maybe he left Germany. Or died. Well, then. If that's the case, I've got nothing to worry about, do I? Kiefer's long gone, and Ilona Fry's a most unreliable witness, and I'm good. It's as likely a scenario as another, I tell myself as I pour another drink. Now the green fairy begins to seriously toy with my brain, and I look up at my collection of masks, running my eyes fondly over the creatures I have become behind them. I'm smiling, my friends. I'm feeling among allies as true as you. They say absinthe has hallucinatory properties. I can't say for sure. But then, among the masks hanging on the wall, the faces of Matty Engel and Tom Burkhart materialize and sharpen. They seem to laugh at me. At first I'm shocked at this intrusion into my inner sanctum. Then I turn violent. I reel to the wall and pick off the masks where the faces of Private Berlin had mocked me, one carved of wood, the other molded in ceramic. I beat them to shards and splinters on the tile floor. When I'm done, when I've totally destroyed them, I get up and stand there, weaving, panting, using the absinthe to summon every bit of my cunning, while forcing myself to face the fact that if Ilona Fry talked, someone will eventually believe her, which means the dogs are most certainly behind me. No panic, my friends. It's not in me. I'm a Berliner. I know how to defend my ground. The trick here is to be smarter than the dogs, to go to water if need be, to double back, or better yet to make a move they're totally not expecting. Double back, I think again. Make a move that will floor them. Suddenly, the green fairy tosses up an idea from deep in my subconscious. I grab it and consider it like a gift, a treasured gift. I smile. How perfect. Yes, I think at last. This particular option is the best way to handle the situation once and for all. How goddamn perfect. I set the glass of absinthe down and cross to a laptop on my desk. I reattach Chris Schneider's hard drive and call up the pictures. I scroll down, looking for the one I want. Ah, there it is. I double-click the icon and up pops a photograph of Matty Engel's son. Nicholas is on one knee, soccer ball in hand, shooting the camera an impish grin. What a lovely little boy, my friends, my fellow Berliners. Quite captivating. I'll bet he's the apple of his mother's eye. Chapter 94 Maddie woke up to the smell of bacon frying and coffee brewing. She actually felt rested for the first time since getting word of Chris's disappearance. But then she thought of High Commissar Dietrich. Why was he being so obstinate in his pursuit of Hermann Kruger? Was he getting pressure from above because of her status? Or was he just a man in grief, trying to put one easy step in front of another for fear of falling? 
Rather than stew any further, she took a quick shower, got dressed, and went out to find Nicholas at the breakfast counter. He was already dressed for school. An empty plate and juice glass sat on the counter in front of him. Aunt C was nowhere to be seen. But Burkhart was at the stove, working a wooden spoon in a cast iron skillet. He's making his specialty, Nicholas informed her. Eggs Burkhart. The one and only, Burkhart said. Want more? I have to go to school, Nicholas said. Maddie? When I get back, she said. I like to walk him. It was a chill, blustery day, and Nicholas's hands got too red and cold for her to hold as they walked. I like Tom, Nicholas said. He doesn't treat you like you're a kid. Is that right? He said I knew more about soccer than most adults. Well, that's true, Maddie said, and mussed his hair. Mom, Nicholas groaned. I just combed it. For who? For me? Or is there another lady in your life? Nicholas looked slightly taken aback, but he said nothing. Friends? Maddie asked. Nicholas shrugged and nodded before asking, What's wrong with Frau Fry? They were nearing John Lennon Gymnasium. Maddie paused, wondering what to tell him. Then she said, She's had a hard and difficult life, one I could not imagine, Nicholas. People like that can be delicate, easy to break. Is that why she's staying with us? He pressed. Yes, Maddie said. And the fact that she was one of Chris's childhood friends, and so was her sister. They reached the corner down the street from the school. Nicholas said, I can walk from here, okay? Maddie could see the school entrance and children streaming into it clearly from where she stood. But she still had a moment's hesitation before thinking that she had to give him his independence slowly and in small increments. Okay, she said. And Aunt C will be here when practice is over, he said in a mild grumble. You sure I can't walk home alone? She shook her head. Maybe next year. Ah, uh, Nicholas groaned. That's not until I'm ten. Exactly. Love you, Nicholas. He pursed his lips and said grudgingly, I love you too, Mommy. Maddie watched her son until he disappeared inside his school, and then she felt odd, as if someone were watching her. But she looked around and saw no one at all. Chapter 95 the feeling of being anonymously scrutinized had fallen away from Maddie by the time she bought the newspapers and returned to the apartment where Aunt Cecilia and Ilona Fry were finishing up plates of eggs Burkhart. This is very good, Aunt Cecilia said. I'm going to get the recipe. Ilona Fry smiled at her, fidgeted, and started scratching at her wrists. Here's yours, Burkhart said, sliding a plate with an egg dish and toast to her. Thanks, Maddie said. She tossed the papers on the table behind her and took a bite of Burkhart's egg concoction. It was good. Really good. What's in this? She asked. Bacon and... It changes every time, Burkhart said. Like stone soup. I need to go to the clinic soon, Ilona Fry announced in a worried voice. As soon as I'm done, Maddie promised, before looking at Burkhart. I'll take her by her apartment to get the things she needs. And me? You're going to look for proof of Falk's existence. Where am I supposed to do that? Start in Ahrensfelde, then go to the special archives, she said. They're right here in Berlin. I know where they are, Burkhart retorted. But don't you think if Falk was in there that his story would have come out by now? We're just looking for his name and some connection to the slaughterhouse, Maddie said. Some tangible proof that Falk was real. He was real. Ilona Fry insisted. We know that, Maddie soothed, but... Her cell phone rang. Katerina Doric began the conversation by saying, An Inspector Weigel just called here for you. Hermann Kruger has surfaced. He's going to appear voluntarily for questioning at Central Crippo this afternoon. Really? Maddie said, surprised. Where's he been? Crippo's not exactly sure where he's been, Katerina admitted. His lawyer's been brokering the surrender deal with the higher-ups. But I figured you'd want to be there. You should probably call Dietrich to arrange it. The High Commissar is probably too hungover to care, 
Maddie said, before describing her frustrating conversation with him the evening before. You're saying he's sticking his head in a hole? Katerina responded. Yes, but why would he? Maddie said. It doesn't make sense. It's not like he's somehow linked to... She stopped, puzzled at a possibility that she hadn't considered before. You all right? Katerina asked. I'll get back to you, Maddie said and hung up. She sat there thinking a second, then jumped up, spun around, and went for the morning newspapers on the table behind her. She checked the indexes and then tore through them before stabbing a finger on a page deep inside the Morgan Post. No obituary, she said out loud. Just a death notice. Whose? Burkhart asked, confused. High Commissar Dietrich's father, Conrad Dietrich Frommer. Chapter 96 Cassiano stirred at the sharp knock on his bedroom door and asked in Portuguese, Who is it? It's me, silly, a woman's lilting voice called back. Open up. Why is your door locked? Cassiano got out of bed wearing a warm-up suit. He glanced at the bathroom before going to the suite door, and then he twisted the deadbolt and opened it. Dressed in skimpy black lingerie, Perfecta stood there holding a tray heaped with fruits and breads and a pot of tea. Cassiano feigned surprise. I didn't know you were in Germany. Perfecta smiled at him as if he were addled, then brushed by him, saying, Of course I am. Right when I said I would be. With enough time to prepare your favorite pregame meal. Cassiano grinned. Put it down over there. Perfecta did, and then turned, skipped into her husband's arms, and kissed him hungrily. Miss me? Every day you've been gone, the soccer star said coolly. I'm home for a whole month now, Perfecta promised. No trips until November. That's excellent, Cassiano said. We should celebrate. Go out after the game somewhere. Eat. See a show. Perfecta hesitated. Yes, of course. Why don't you eat and then we'll burn some calories in bed, get you relaxed before your game? She made to head toward the bed, but the striker stopped her, saying, Sit first. We'll eat a little snack together. It will make us stronger for love. Perfecta looked uncomfortable, but then she smiled brightly. I just ate. Cassiano poured from the teapot. Tea, then? You love green tea. He held the teacup out to her. So good for the skin. Perfecta looked worried, and then she shook her head. No, I've already had three glasses this morning. I insist, her husband said. She appeared insulted and her nostrils flared. No. I insist, Cassiano retorted with a hard edge to his voice. Perfecta stepped toward him but did not take the teacup. She ran her hand across the front of his training pants. Let's see if we can... The door to the bathroom burst open. Out jumped Jack Morgan, Daniel Brecht, and Georg Johansson, an agent with the Bundeskriminalamt, or BKA, the German Federal Criminal Police. Agent Johansson flashed his badge and said, Perfecta Dolores, you are under arrest for wire fraud, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and the attempted murder of your husband. You bitch, Cassiano snarled, throwing the tea at her. Chapter 97 Morgan, Brecht, and Johansson grilled Perfecta for almost an hour on her whereabouts and activities during the last ten days. She spoke decent English. At first, she indignantly claimed that she had been in Africa on a photo shoot and threatened to sue them all for defamation of character. Then they showed her Dr. Gabrielle's analysis of Cassiano's hair, which indicated that he'd been exposed to low doses of cyanide. Not enough to kill him, but enough to make him nauseated and off for a couple of days. I have no idea how that could have happened, Perfecta insisted. No idea, Morgan said, picking up the teapot. I'm betting there's some form of raw Brazilian manioc in this tea. The raw stuff contains cyanide, as I'm sure you know. Everyone in Brazil has to know that. Perfecta denied her involvement again, before Cassiano shouted at her, who do you poison me for? Maxim Pavel? For the first time, Morgan saw a crack in the fashion model's facade, even as she started to say, 
I don't... Cassiano hit the remote, and the screen was filled with the image of Perfecta stripping for Pavel in the hotel hallway. How could you do this to me with him? Her husband shouted in outrage. He's twice my age. And he knows how to use his hands, not his feet, Perfecta shot back. They got it all out of her eventually. She'd done it out of greed. It was true that her husband might make good money at Manchester United, possibly as much as 1.5 million euros a year. But Pavel had offered her 20 times that in the betting scam. Did Pavel kill Chris Schneider? Breck demanded. Who? Perfecta asked, her puzzlement undisguised. Who? Brecht echoed. He worked at private, Morgan said. We think he was on to the swindle. I've never heard of him. Where's Pavel now? Brecht asked. She shrugged. I don't know. He disappears for days at a time. He's very secretive, but frankly, I didn't want to know where he goes. Uh-huh, Morgan said. Well, I can tell you that after the beating he's going to take this afternoon on the Hertha Berlin game, he's going to come looking for you, Perfecta, and he's not going to be happy. As a matter of fact, I expect him to be homicidal. Chapter 98 Maddie walked out of the methadone clinic with Ilona Fry, who was glassy-eyed and moving slowly with a contented expression. But Maddie craned her head all around, looking everywhere, knowing that the clinic was a choke point in Ilona's life, a place where she could be counted on to show up, a place where someone like Falk might try to attack her. But they made it to the car safely. Do you think Burkhart will find the records? Ilona asked. Maddie wanted to say that she doubted it, but she replied, I've learned that he's a very determined man. Ilona blinked several times. I heard they were shredding everything they could at the end. It's what started it all. The end, I mean. Do you remember? Other than Nicholas's birth, they were the greatest days of my life. People were dancing and singing, Ilona recalled as Maddie pulled away from the curb. Ilza and I left the orphanage with Chris and Artur and Kiefer and Greta and came to Berlin. We wanted to see what was happening for ourselves. Maddie remembered everything about those days. How extraordinary it felt to be 16 with everything suddenly new and everything possible. She started to sing the Jesus Jones song, Right Here, Right Now. A woman on the radio talks about revolution. Ilona joined in with her. When it's already passed her by. They stopped singing. Their smiles sagged. In a faraway voice, Ilona said, When we got to Berlin, I saw the crowds and got scared. I kept looking for him in the crowds, for Falk. Chris tried to convince me that we would never see him again. But I think he was there somewhere that night, Maddie. I could feel him. Everyone else was so happy. But I felt like he was right there as the wall was coming down. Even though we'd been freed from the state, I knew we would never be safe from Falk. Until yesterday, I hadn't seen him in almost 30 years. But he was in my thoughts constantly. Falk. He ate at my mind. He... Maddie glanced over to see tears streaming down Ilona's face again as she said, I didn't know who I was half the time. I invented things. Lives. I... She started to rub her hands as if washing them and began a slow rocking motion. Maddie wanted to pull over and calm her, but then her cell phone rang. Angle, she said. I've been at it all night, Maddie, Dr. Gabrielle said. I tried every database I could think of. There's no Kiefer Brown in Germany that comes close to matching our guy. Maddie's heart sank. What? Is he dead? Left the country? No, he's here in Berlin, the scientist replied. He changed his name three times. Chapter 99 I look in the mirror as I apply the last bit of makeup. Sadly, I think, 
This may be the last mask in my superb collection of original one-time creations. When I'm finished with my disguise, I return to my masks, letting my eyes linger on old favorites. The Dogons and the Indonesians, and new friends like the Chakwe and Jaguar masks. But as I know I must, I leave them all in favor of Chris Schneider's private ID and badge, doctored now with my disguised face in place of his. I gather up the other things I need, rope and parachute cord, cigarettes, and a little something to light them with, a screwdriver, leather gloves, two pistols equipped with suppressors and six magazines of ammunition, and four passports and supporting documentation for four different identities. I also have a heavy-duty trunk with wheels. It's filled with enough cash and gold coins to allow me to live well for a very long time. A nest egg amassed and set aside years ago in the event that I ever had to leave my beloved Berlin for good. And now, here I am, my friends, my fellow Berliners, about to shed my skin and flee my beautiful city of scars forever. I smile bittersweetly as I return to my private place one last time. I look around at what I've built for myself, the collage of my life, thinking of all the events and experiences that have changed me, made me a different person than the one I once was. Certainly better spoken, more calculating, and slyer than that bloodthirsty young bumpkin. I check my watch. It's almost two. I shut off the light and close the door. After one more errand, I'm off to school. After the trouble I've gone to, I can't take the chance of missing little Nicholas now, can I? Hmm... Chapter 100 When Maddie and Katerina Doric followed Inspector Weigel into a darkened observation room at Crippo headquarters around quarter to three that afternoon, Hermann Kruger was sitting at an interrogation table on the other side of a two-way mirror. The billionaire was an extremely fit man in his early fifties who wore a 5,000-euro black suit and had skin so smooth that Maddie swore he was wearing a little makeup. At the same time, Kruger's posture was ramrod straight, and the bearing of his head was both imperious and enraged, as if he were disgusted to even be in such a predicament, and eager to rip off the head of whomever had had the gall to summon him to Berlin Crippo. Kruger's lawyer, a slight, intense man named Richter, must have picked up on his client's aura because he nudged him and then whispered something in the billionaire's ear just as the door to the interrogation room opened. High Commissar Dietrich shambled in wearing a rumpled suit and holding a bulging manila file under one arm and a coffee in the opposite hand. His eyes were bloodshot and his hair in disarray, and Mattie thought his skin looked as sallow as candle wax. See? Mattie muttered. I'll bet his head is just pounding. Inspector Weigel frowned, but then she sighed and nodded before replying, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and let him prove you wrong. We're not wrong, Inspector, Maddie said. You heard just the same, Inspector Weigel replied curtly, before turning her attention to Dietrich, whose hand trembled as he set the coffee on the table. He spilled a little, apologized, and got a napkin, making a show of cleaning it, moving so slowly that Hermann Kruger's patience was tested, and Richter, his lawyer, once again had to whisper in his ear. At last, Dietrich sat and with mock cheer said, we're hoping you can clear up a few things for us, Hermann. Kruger's cheeks flushed. He wasn't used to having someone of his station in life addressed with such familiarity by someone like Dietrich. Herr Kruger wants to cooperate, High Commissar, Richter said. Good, that's fine. But I think we'll let your client talk from now on. The billionaire cleared his throat. What do you want to know? For starters, where have you been? Kruger hesitated and then replied, I can't discuss that for another hour or so. There would be severe financial consequences 
if it were to come out too soon. Chapter 101 A beat of silence passed before Dietrich growled, I don't care about financial implications. There are legal implications if you don't start talking to me. Think murder charges, Hermann. Did you kill your wife? Kruger looked outraged and sputtered, I most certainly did not. You most certainly had reason to, the High Commissar said, in such an agreeable and inviting conversational tone that Maddie found herself thinking differently of Dietrich. Despite his faults, the man was a master interrogator. In short, quick succession, he hit the billionaire with the mistresses, the prostitutes, and the Private Berlin investigation into his life. You found out that Private Berlin was looking at your extramarital activities on Agnes's behalf, Dietrich said. You decided word of your perversion would harm your reputation, so you killed Christoph Schneider and then your wife in revenge, and you fed Schneider's body to rats in a secret basement in an old abandoned slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. Kruger got beat red and choked out, That's... that's... His attorney snarled. Slanderous, High Commissar. My client did no such thing. He had absolutely no involvement in his wife's murder or Schneider's. The billionaire found his voice. And I have no idea what goddamn slaughterhouse you're talking about. Your stepson thinks you killed your wife, Dietrich said calmly. Or had her killed. He would, the little leeching bastard, Kruger said evenly. I repeat... I had nothing to do with Agnes's death. And yet, you did not rush home when you heard about it, the High Commissar remarked. As I understood it, she was dead, Kruger replied. Not sick, not dying. Dead. I was upset and grief-stricken, but I knew I could not change that sorry state of affairs, and I had vital business to conclude. With who, Hermann? Dietrich demanded. Tell me where you've been and now, or that will be the story presented in your indictment, the one the press and the bloggers will devour and spit out at the corporate world. Kruger acted like he had bugs on his skin. He squirmed and said to his lawyer, I pay you enough. Make him understand what's at stake here. Richter checked his watch. As a matter of fact, I think it's safe to talk now, Herr Kruger. The markets close in one hour. As long as the High Commissar agrees not to talk about this conversation until four, you're free to speak. Hearing that, Maddie checked her watch. Three o'clock. School is getting out. She flashed on an image of Nicholas leaving with Aunt C, and then returned her attention to the billionaire, who finally looked ready to tell all. Chapter 102 Friends, fellow Berliners, it's five past three when my soon-to-be young friend Nicholas Engel walks out the front of the John Lennon Gymnasium. He's looking for his mother's aunt, but the poor dear won't be making an appearance today, I've made sure of that. The boy looks upset. How perfect. I make my move and pull the Mercedes forward and roll down the window. Nicholas! I call in an affected Dutch accent. Nicholas Engel. I'm holding out my private Berlin badge and identification and smiling at him. I'm Daniel Brecht. Your mother's probably mentioned me. She asked me to come get you and take you home. Nicholas looks at me suspiciously. Where's my aunt, Cecilia? I give him a sad smile. That's why your mother asked me to come. Your aunt is sick, very sick. She was taken to the hospital. That does it. The dear boy's defenses drop, and clearly worried, he moves straight to the guard door and climbs in, asking, What's wrong with her? They don't know, I say. She collapsed at home and they're running tests. Now buckle your seatbelt. Nicholas does. Right away. No argument. What a remarkable boy. So earnest, so obedient. Where's my mom? Nicholas asks as I put the Mercedes in gear and pull away from the school. Don't worry, I say. She'll be joining us shortly. Nicholas frowns, looks around, and says, 
This isn't the way to my house. Where are we going? A special place, I say. A very special place for a very special boy. Chapter 103 For the past ten days I've been in Sweden, Hermann Kruger announced. I've been staying at a hunting lodge near Ostersund that belongs to the Swedish financier Ola Larsson. Ola and I have been negotiating the sale of my empire. I wished to enjoy the rest of my life and do some good with my money. I'd hoped Agnes would like to stay with me and help me do good. But the last time I spoke to her, she told me she wanted a divorce. Not how we heard it, Dietrich said. She was staying. Kruger shook his head. She was leaving me. Your stepson says otherwise, Dietrich replied. My stepson is a jackass, High Commissar, Kruger snapped. In the meantime, I've got pressing things to attend to, and unless you plan to arrest me, I must leave now. Herr Richter will provide you with Herr Larsen's private number. He and several of his aides and the staff at the lodge will attest to my whereabouts. Remember, you are sworn to secrecy until four. Kruger got to his feet as if the meeting were over. Dietrich did as well, and Maddie could see he looked bewildered at the sudden turn of events. But then he regained his footing. Do you own a chalkway mask? That startled him. Yes? Why? Have you ever been to the Paradise FKK in Bad Homburg? He shrugged. Once, perhaps, I don't know. We found the murder weapon in one of your vehicles, the High Commissar said. I can place you under arrest based solely on that. The weapon is an obvious attempt to frame Herr Kruger, the attorney said. And I don't see any connection between a chalkway mask and an FKK in Bad Homburg. If you're sure of yourself, arrest Herr Kruger. But rest assured, we will sue for damages. Otherwise, we're leaving. Dietrich hesitated, but then said, I'll need to know where you're going, whether you intend to leave the country again. I need to attend to Agnes's funeral arrangements, Kruger replied, imperious once more. Right after I place orders to buy more shares in my company. With all this talk of murder and takeover, Kruger Industries is undervalued now, but will most certainly jump in price once word of the deal gets out. You should buy too, High Commissar. I promise you'll make a killing. Maddie watched as the billionaire left the room. His lawyer placed a piece of paper in front of Dietrich and followed. Inspector Weigel looked at Maddie and sighed. You were right. Do we do this now or do we wait a little bit? Sooner the better, Maddie said. You want him on the defensive. Katerina had been silent during the entire interrogation, but now she said, I just thought of something else. She headed toward the door. What? Maddie said. Where are you going? I have a follow-up question. I've got to catch Kruger before he leaves the building. Chapter 104 Hopped, Commissar, Inspector Weigel said. She stood uneasily at the door to the interrogation room where Dietrich was sitting at the table, looking like he'd lost a crucial game. Go away, Weigel, he said. I have to think. Sir, if you please, she began. I'm not pleased the High Commissar snapped. Inspector Weigel stood straighter and with a firm voice said, Sir, I believe that with the help of Private Berlin, I've made a major break in the case. Dietrich's brow knitted and he looked up at her. With Private Berlin? Yes, sir. You mean you've been cooperating with them without my knowledge? Sir, you have not been yourself lately, and you placed me in charge while you dealt with your father's... The High Commissar slammed his hand on the table. Don't tell me who I've been, Weigel. I could destroy your career for this. You'll have to leave Crippo. You'll be lucky to find a spot with city police, a meter maid, a traffic cop. Inspector Weigel's face had turned a rose color, and her voice shook as she said, Be that as it may, sir, I've had a witness brought in for questioning. A witness? Dietrich said, taken aback. A witness to what? Sir, if you'll come with me, he's in interrogation room B. I thought you'd want to observe. Observe? My interrogation, sir. 
Maddie watched the entire scene from behind the two-way mirror before finding her way to a similar room and similar two-way mirror across the hall. A man in a beard and workman's clothes sat alone at the table, staring at his hands and picking at his calluses in frustration. The door to the observation booth opened, and High Commissar Dietrich entered. When he saw Maddie, his entire body tightened. You. What are you doing here? Who gave you permission to be here? Inspector Weigel, Maddie replied calmly. Weigel, Dietrich cried as the door opened behind him. She has no authority. She, she has my authority, Hans, said the tall, bald man behind him. His name was Karl Gottschalk. He was the High Commissar's supervisor. Yours, Karl? You can't be serious, Dietrich said. I'm always serious about murder, Hans, Gottschalk said. Let's see where your young protege takes us. On the other side of the two-way mirror, Inspector Weigel had entered the interrogation room and was moving toward the table and the man waiting. The High Commissar seemed to notice him for the first time. He craned his head toward Maddie. What nonsense have you been feeding Weigel? Who is that man in there? Maddie gazed evenly at Dietrich and said, He goes by several names. None of them correct. Chapter 105 Can you tell me your name for the record? Inspector Weigel asked. Am I under arrest? The man across the table from her demanded. We don't think you've done anything wrong. You were brought in for questioning. Your name? Gerhard Kreiner, he replied. Occupation? I own a construction business. We rehab apartment buildings. How long have you been at this business, Herr Kreiner? Fifteen years. Look, I don't understand what I'm being... In due time, Herr Kreiner, Inspector Weigel said, cutting him off. You've changed your name four times in your life. Kreiner's chin retreated toward his throat. So? It was done legally. Every time I wanted a new start. A completely new start. You were once known as Kiefer Brown? He hesitated, but then nodded. A long time ago. You grew up in an orphanage, did you not? Weisenhaus 44? Kreiner frowned and didn't answer for a moment. I did, but... Inspector Weigel cut him off again. Tell me about the slaughterhouse. Kreiner blinked several times, and Maddie thought he looked like a man waking up from hypnosis. He replied in a thin voice. I don't know what you're talking about. The slaughterhouse, Inspector Weigel insisted. The abattoir south of Ahrensfelde. Kreiner blinked again before saying, I'm sorry. I grew up in Leipzig. My parents died in a car accident. I don't know anything about any slaughterhouse. Inside the observation room, High Commissar Dietrich made a harumphing noise as if in satisfaction. What about a man named Falk? Inspector Weigel asked. No, I don't know him either. Never heard of him. Dietrich made that noise again and then said, This is a waste of time. I'm leaving, right? Karl Gottschalk caught him by the elbow. Wait. Weigel had gotten up from the interrogation table. She went to the door and opened it. Ilona Fry shuffled in, her head bowed. Kreiner stared at her, trying to figure out who she was, until she said, Hello, Kiefer. It's me, Ilona. Ilona Fry. The man looked like he'd seen a ghost or a zombie, but he said, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Ilona took that like a slap to the face. I'm Ilza's sister, Kiefer, please. You know me, and you know what happened to us in the slaughterhouse. No, I don't, he said, but he would no longer look at her. Chris is dead, Ilona screamed at him. So is Greta, and Ilza, and Artur. Kreiner's head rocked back in disbelief. What? I- Falk's alive, she blubbered. He tried to kill me last night, and he'll try to kill you if he finds out who you are. Kreiner was suddenly wrapped up in a faraway expression, as if he were watching some horror from a great distance. If you don't tell, he's won, Ilona pleaded. Please, tell them. They think I'm insane. Tell them or they won't believe me. Tell them 
or we both die. Chapter 106 Kreiner's jaw was trembling, and tears came to his eyes when he at last allowed himself to look at Ilona Fry. In a voice that sounded to Maddie like a lost boy's, he said, I've never spoken about it, Ilona. Not one word. Ilona walked to him and put her hand on his shoulder, weeping. I know. None of us did. None of us. He said he'd kill us if we ever talked. Falk's already trying to kill you, Inspector Weigel said. We're offering you protection, but only if you tell us what we want to know. Over the course of the next hour, Kreiner's story came out in fits and starts, but it corroborated much of what Ilona Fry had told Maddie and Burkhardt the evening before. Kreiner was born in Leipzig, where he was christened Edmund Tillermann. When he was six, his father, an attorney who had been speaking out against the communist government, simply disappeared. Ilona Fry's real name was Karin Klauser. Ilse's was Annette. They were born and raised in Thuringen. Their father, a scientist, vanished when Ilona was eight and Ilza was five. Several weeks after their father's disappearances, both Kreiner and Ilona Fry remembered men pounding on their doors in the middle of the night and then their mothers crying and begging for mercy. The men grabbed them from their beds. They took their mothers, too. They were taken to the slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. They were put in those rooms to either side of the anteroom hallway. There were bunks bolted into the walls, a metal pot, and little else. At one point, 15 women were held there along with their 16 children. In the dead of night, a young man no more than 20 would come. They knew him only as Falk, and most nights, he would select a mother and her child or children and bring them into the slaughterhouse itself. Falk put the mothers through unimaginable pain, hanging them on meat hooks by their handcuffs so their arms dislocated. He burned their feet with cigarettes. He whipped them, cut them, and raped them, trying to get them to turn evidence against their husbands, their husbands' friends, and their families. Falk made Kreiner, Chris, Ilona, and the other children watch what he did to their mothers. Falk said he thought it made the mother's torture even more unbearable, and therefore made them more likely to talk about their crimes against the state. If and when that didn't work, Falk tortured the children in front of their mothers. And when he thought he'd gotten everything out of our mothers, Kreiner said, Falk killed them with a screwdriver and dumped their bodies in a well filled with rats. Chapter 107 Kreiner broke down completely, and Ilona Fry threw her arms around him, saying, Thank you, Kiefer. Now they'll believe. They'll believe. I'll give you two a moment, Inspector Weigel said. She got up, ashen-faced, and looked right at the two-way mirror before heading to the door. High Commissar Dietrich looked much sicker than a man with a brutal hangover, Maddie thought. He stared at the two people in the interrogation room with an expression that was drifting toward hopelessness. But when Inspector Weigel came into the observation room, carrying a manila folder that she handed to Karl Gottschalk, Dietrich said, This can't be true. It would have come out after the wall fell. A place like the slaughterhouse would have come out. Maddie crossed her arms. Not if all the files about it were destroyed before the uprising started, long before the wall came down. They burned files in every state agency, Inspector Weigel said. Everyone knows that. So which one was Falk working for? The Stasi? The secret police? Dietrich said nothing. Maddie noticed Dietrich's boss studying him intently. He had to have been Stasi, Maddie said, watching Dietrich now as well. They used torture and execution at Hohenschönhausen prison to make family members testify against one another. Starvation, sleep deprivation, mock drowning. But this is beyond the pale, Dietrich said in a hushed voice. Depraved. Yes, Maddie said. It was. The high commissar looked at his supervisor and said in a voice more sure of its convictions, Carl, 
without some kind of documentation. Documentation? Maddie cried, cutting him off. You've got eyewitnesses. Look at them, High Commissar. Do they look like they're lying? Inside the interrogation room, tiny Ilona Fry was still holding on to Kreiner, who was sobbing. Falk stuck a screwdriver in the back of my mother's head, Ilona, and I just stood there and watched him do it. Dietrich's shoulders suddenly rolled so far forward that he looked like a wading bird cowering in the shadows. In a shaky voice, he said, I'm sorry, Carl. I... I can't believe that... Hi, Commissar, Inspector Weigel said sharply. Why have you been trying to steer this investigation as far from the slaughterhouse and Falk as possible? Dietrich looked shocked and then indignant in his response to Karl Gottschalk. I have not, and I certainly won't have a rookie investigator questioning my... You have tried to slow or thwart this investigation from the beginning, Maddie said firmly. Inspector Weigel says that you considered Burkhardt and me enemies from the outset. She was mistaken in my meaning, he snapped. Why would I have any interest in doing such a terrible, unproductive thing? Because, Haupt Commissar, Maddie said, your father, Colonel Conrad Dietrich Frommer, was Stasi. And before you changed your name, you were Stasi too. Chapter 108 That's an out-and-out out lie, Dietrich shot back. You have no proof of that. Karl Gottschalk looked pained and pitying when he said, Unfortunately, she does, High Commissar. He placed a photocopied document in front of Dietrich. This is your application to become a trainee cadet at the GDR's Ministry for State Security as Hans Dietrich Frommer son of Conrad Dietrich Frommer. Dietrich gazed in disbelief at the document. This isn't real. They... That document is very real, his supervisor stated flatly. After Frau Engel and Inspector Weigel came to me with Ilona Fry, I petitioned the federal commissioner for the Stasi archives to do a rapid search for us. She balked at first, but when I told her it concerned an ongoing murder investigation, she agreed to help us. Karl Gottschalk's face turned stony as he placed another paper in front of Dietrich. This is a copy of your application to Berlin Kripo, six months after you changed your name and thirteen months after the wall fell. You did not mention the name change on your application. You did not disclose anything about the year you spent as a member of the East German secret police, Hans. Nor did you disclose your father's long involvement. You wrote in your application that your father was a carpenter, a conveniently dead carpenter. Dietrich sighed and said nothing at first. Then he looked up at them all, a broken man. I hid who I was, because I wanted to be a policeman, as my father had been, and my grandfather had been. I did not care for politics. I still do not. I have only wanted to be one thing my entire life, a policeman. The High Commissar explained that he had spent just 11 months as a recruit to the Stasi. I laid down my weapon after I was ordered to go to Gethsemane Church. I heard what they wanted me to do there, and I walked away. I'd heard about people shredding paper as well. So I walked away three weeks before the wall fell and joined the protests. Why lie, then? Karl Gottschalk demanded. It was a strange time after the wall fell, Karl, remember? Dietrich said. I had no job, little food, no place to live. And there were many people from the East who wanted revenge on anyone associated with the Stasi and they were right to want it. I had done nothing wrong, but even so, I could read the writing on the wall. Being a member and son of the Stasi would only hurt me in the new Germany. So I lied. What about the slaughterhouse? Maddie asked. Did you suspect it had been used as a torture chamber? Or did you know? Dietrich took a deep breath and said, Suspected. The High Commissar described a night when he was in his early teens. 
His father came home drunk. He got on the phone, and Dietrich overheard the colonel's side of the conversation. He was ranting and raving about all sorts of things, Dietrich recalled. But then I heard him saying that he feared being caught up in what he called, quote, barbaric secrets associated with the auxiliary slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. He also said that he would not go down for, quote, that man. Who was he referring to? Maddie asked. I don't know. Did you ever ask him? Inspector Weigel asked. Dietrich cleared his throat. I did, Weigel. Twice. Both times within the last five days. The first time, he told me to stay away from the slaughterhouse. The second time, he had a stroke and died. Who else knew about the slaughterhouse other than your father? Maddie asked. Do you know who he was talking to that night? I don't know for sure, the High Commissar replied. But I suspect it was one of the men who helped bury my father yesterday. Chapter 109 Inside a fourth-floor room at the Hotel de Rome, Jack Morgan paced, checked his watch, and glanced back and forth at the television and Daniel Brecht's iPad. The television sportscaster was giving a spirited report on the manner in which Cassiano, in a rare afternoon match, had completely dissected the Dusseldorf defense, scoring four goals, two of them single-handedly. Breck's screen, meanwhile, showed the exterior hallway and the interior of the adjacent hotel room where Perfecta stood in a sheer white nightgown, looking in the mirror and tending to her makeup. I still can't understand why she went for Pavel's scam, Georg Johansson said. I mean, look at her. She could have anything she wanted. Morgan shrugged. I assume there's more to this than she's telling us. There always is. But 20 million euros is a solid motive for crime, no matter how beautiful you are. Here we go, Brecht said, gesturing at the hallway feed, which showed an irate Maxim Pavel storm past the camera. They heard him pounding on the door off screen and through the other feed inside Perfecta's hotel room. The Brazilian model did not move, but then Brecht said, Answer the door. Get him to talk. Perfecta had a radio bud in her ear. I can't, she whispered. You can and will, if you want any chance at a judge giving you leniency. Perfecta nodded, but went hesitantly to the door and opened it, saying, Maxim, you're early. I only just... The Russian nightclub owner smacked her in the face so hard, she stumbled backward and crashed to the hotel room floor. You whore, he seethed, kicking the door shut behind him. You stupid Brazilian whore. What, Maxim? Perfecta cried, cowering from him. What did I do? Do? he shouted. Your husband played brilliantly this afternoon, and I lost millions on the spread. Millions! With that, Pavel threw himself on her, got his hands around her neck, and began to choke her. Now, Morgan said. Agent Johansson burst through the door into the next room, gun drawn, yelling, BKA! German Federal Police. He grabbed the nightclub owner by the collar and swung him up and around and slammed him against the wall. You're under arrest. For what? Pavel managed to demand. Assault to start, Johansson said, snapping the handcuffs on. Fraud, conspiracy, attempted murder. There will be other charges, I'm sure. Like four counts of premeditated murder, Morgan said as Johansson spun Pavel around and Brecht helped Perfecta up from the floor. Pavel looked at her and Morgan with contempt. I've never killed anyone. That right? Brecht said. Where have you been the last few days? Take a trip to Frankfurt? Spend some time with Greta Amsel, Herr Falk? Falk, the nightclub owner said. Frankfurt? I don't know any Greta. Then where have you been since we saw you last? Morgan demanded. Pavel hesitated and then shrugged, saying, I have an ironclad alibi. I was with my lover, my real lover. His name is Alex. He lives in Vienna. Alex? Perfecta asked, incredulous. You said you are straight. The nightclub owner laughed at her. And you're dumber than I thought. I own a drag queen club, for God's sake. 
Chapter 110 Forty minutes later, as the sun began to set, Katerina Dorak wandered off Oranienburgerstrasse into Takalas. She walked through the art collective's archway, which led to the large outdoor art area behind the building. The dusk throbbed with a blend of hip-hop and techno and glowed like a movie set. Spotlights were trained on the opening of Rudy Kruger's Rude, Rot, Riot exhibition, which had attracted a crowd of anarchists, punks, street people, artists, musicians, poets, and other assorted Berliners who were drinking heavily from an open bar. Katerina Doric spotted the man of the hour dressed entirely in black, standing with his arm around his student, Tanya. He was holding a beer bottle and shaking hands with an admirer who had a fluorescent green mohawk and tiny skulls on chains hanging from his pierced nose. Rudy Kruger spotted Doric and grimaced when she came up to him after the mohawk man moved on. Why are you here? he asked caustically. I'm not talking to you or anyone. You and Crippo let Hermann go, and now he's shutting me out of planning for her funeral. I work for private. Letting your stepfather go wasn't my call, and I can't control his actions either, Doric said. I came to support your opening. I figured you could use it. But I see you've got more than enough, and I'm not wanted here, so I'll go. Tanya frowned and squeezed him around the waist. Rude, be nice. She's just trying to help. Doric noticed then that Tanya was wearing a black leather jacket that had to have cost at least 1,500 euro. It made Doric more confident. Okay, all right. I'm an asshole sometimes, Rudy Kruger said. I'm sorry. Apology accepted, Doric said. Quite the bash. He shrugged. One thing I learned from Hermann, you want to be known, you better yell a lot. Want a beer? Maybe later, Doric said. Did you know your stepfather maintains that your mother was divorcing him? He's lying, Rudy Kruger said immediately, and then hesitated. I don't know why, but he's lying. That was the irony. She was staying with him, selling out for the money. Katerina Doric shook her head. According to him, your mother had laid down the line. Despite the fact that he'd pledged to turn his pursuits to philanthropy, she'd decided to leave with her dignity intact. That's the irony. If she'd done it, you were the only one who would have been screwed, Rudy. Chapter 111 Rudy Kruger's lips thinned. What the fuck you talking about? Your mother's prenuptial agreement, Doric said. Before he left Crippo headquarters, I asked Hermann if you were mentioned in the agreement. Know what he told me? The billionaire's stepson shrugged. He said the deal worked like this, Doric said. If your mother stayed married to Hermann until his death, she would inherit his entire fortune, which meant you would eventually inherit a fortune. I don't care about money, he said flatly. And so what? It also stated that if your mother divorced Hermann, she would get only ten million. I told you that, Rudy Kruger replied. You did, Doric said. But what's interesting is that the third provision in the agreement states that if Agnes died first in marriage, her husband would provide you, Rudy, with a full tenth share of his fortune, which as of the close of trading today was worth close to four hundred million euros. He stared at her. If you say so. I told you I don't care about money. I'll probably give it to this place, make sure it survives. Maybe some of it, Doric replied. But the rest, I think, you'll use for your own gain and leisure. He laughed bitterly at her. Fuck you. Who are you? You don't know me. What are you trying to say, that I killed my mother? I wasn't anywhere near my mother when she was shot. I was here at a rally for Takalas. I know, Katerina Doric said. We checked. There you go, then, he shot back. So why don't you take your vicious innuendo and get the hell out of here? Katerina ignored him, looking instead at his girlfriend and saying, But you know, Tanya, very few people seem to remember you being at the rally. Me? I was there, she said indignantly. Lots of people saw me. Name one, 
Doric said. Rude, she said. Convenient? There were others, she protested. Doric shook her head. No. You left the rally shortly after it began and went to Wilmersdorf. You knew Agnes was going out to lunch because Rudy told you she was going to lunch with her friend Ingrid Dahl at Restaurant Carré. You knew the route she'd likely take leaving. You waited, and you shot her. You have no proof of that, Tanya said, her voice breaking toward a whine. We will, Doric said, or rather, Crippo will. They're searching Rudy's studio right now. What? Rudy Kruger yelled, pulling away from his girlfriend. For a moment, Tanya looked too stunned to move, but then she tried to take off. Doric was too quick. She grabbed Tanya and shoved her arm up behind her back. I had no idea, Rudy Kruger was shouting at Doric. If she did this, she did it on her own. Stupid, crazy bitch. At that, Tanya went berserk and started spitting words at him. What? This was your idea. You said no one would ever suspect me. This was your idea. You said we could do good with that money. We could save Takalas and other places and live a righteous life. That's not true, he said, and turned as if to get away from her. But Inspector Weigel stood in his way. Chapter 112 Maddie and High Commissar Dietrich exited the S-Bahn at Alexanderplatz. They crossed the plaza where the protests had peaked before the fall of the wall. Dietrich was on his cell phone. Maddie snapped hers shut in frustration. Since leaving Crippo headquarters, she'd been trying unsuccessfully to reach her Aunt Cecilia, Nicholas, and Tom Burkhart. She'd not heard from any of them the entire day. Maddie glanced at the high commissar who was listening closely. She had thought his career was finished when he admitted to lying his way into Berlin Crippo, but his boss, Karl Gottschalk, had surprised her telling Dietrich he would face a severe disciplinary hearing and probably suspension. But in the meantime, he was to use his father's contacts to find Falk. Dietrich hung up and smiled at her in chagrin. Your associate, Frau Dorek, was right. Weigel just placed Rudy Kruger and his girlfriend under arrest for Agnes's murder. Maddie shook her head. The anarchist did it for the money. They turned onto Karl Marx Alley just as night fully seized Berlin. The temperature had been climbing all afternoon, but a wind was picking up. As they passed the Café Moscow, Maddie smelled ozone. A storm was coming. Fast. There he is, Dietrich said, slowing and gesturing toward a glass-walled and steel-framed box of a building that exuded a soft, silvery glow. The other side of the bar, his back to the wall. Maddie peered into the Bar Babette, one of the hippest watering holes in Berlin, with a retro 1960s decor and an artsy clientele. The place was sparsely populated at this early hour of the evening. Even so, the stout old man in the gray suit and dark topcoat looked jarringly out of place. Let me do the talking, Dietrich said, and went to the front door. Maddie followed him into the bar and looked over his shoulder at the man sitting in the suit and topcoat before a tumbler of vodka. His face was rectangular, sloughing, and pale. Pouches of wrinkled skin hung below his watery eyes, which were huge, dull blue, and watchful. He studied Dietrich and Maddie in turn. Who is this woman, Hans? the old man asked. Her name is Maddie Engel, Willi, Dietrich said. She used to be a valued member of Crippo, but we lost her talents to Private Berlin a few years ago. She's been working on the same case. The man nodded and held out his hand. You can think of me as Willi Fassbinder. It's not my real name, but no matter. Hans tells me you wish to talk about life in the East before the wall fell. Are you new to Berlin? I grew up in West Berlin, she said. But to be more exact, we... But Fassbinder spoke right over her. Did you know that this was the cultural center, the nucleus of the arts and society in the GDR? He pointed out the window. The Kino International across the street was where all the great films premiered. The Café Moscow was the most famous club in the East. Just next door here was the Mocha Milch Ice Bar, 
the best place for children to eat ice cream in all of East Germany. They had these little slivers of chocolate they'd put on Sundays that they called Pity Platch. My daughter loved them. Do you remember the ice bar, Hans? They wrote a song about it, a big hit. Dietrich replied, I remember the song, but I never came here, Willi. No? Fassbinder said, seeming surprised. He smiled at Maddie. And this place was a beauty salon. Babette's Cosmetique. My late wife would come here every other Tuesday to have her hair and nails done in the latest styles from Moscow and Leningrad. His face was melancholy with nostalgia. It's why I suggested this place to meet when Hans said you wanted to speak of the past. I often come here to think of those days. Chapter 113 A waitress came to take their orders, espressos for Maddie and Dietrich, and two more fingers of vodka on the rocks for Fassbinder. As soon as she walked away, Dietrich said, Actually, Vili, we wanted to talk to you about things and events that may have occurred within the Ministry for State Security. Things and events that my father may have described to you in a drunken late-night telephone conversation many, many years ago. Fassbender's nostrils flared instantly, and Maddie sensed a wall go up around him. She doubted they would get cooperation from the old man. Most Berliners have moved on, Hans, Fassbender said crisply after several moments of silence. They no longer wish to talk of the ministry. Please, Willi. I tried to talk of these things with my father right before he collapsed and died. His secrets killed him. I saw it with my own eyes. Fassbinder's attitude changed several degrees, as though he were wondering about his own impending fate. Finally, he asked, What things? Maddie said, The slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde, and a man named Falk. We believe he worked there for the Stasi. The waitress returned with their drinks. While she set them out, Maddie watched as the old man maintained a blank expression, zero reaction. Did Falk work for the Stasi? Dietrich asked when the waitress left. Fassbinder took a long sip of his vodka, coughed, and said carefully, No, not in any official capacity, and by that I mean that I believe you will never find a trace of him in the special Stasi archives, nor in the logs of Hohenschonhausen prison or anywhere else, I imagine. And as I understand it, that slaughterhouse was destroyed just a few days ago so there isn't anything I can say that would not be conjecture and hearsay on my part. Maddie felt herself growing angry. Well, Villy, or whoever you really are, there's no hearsay or conjecture in the fact that I was in the sub-basement of that slaughterhouse before it blew. I saw where the corpses of the tortured mothers were fed to rats while their children watched. I saw the bones myself. That turned Fassbinder aghast and his skin ashen. I... I had no idea that these things were occurring there. Absolutely no idea. I will go to my grave telling you that. But my father knew, didn't he? Dietrich demanded. He found out about the slaughterhouse. He got very drunk one night, and he told you he could not stand being a part of these heinous crimes, and that he would not go down with whoever ordered the tortures and killings. Didn't he? Fassbinder's head tilted back as if pulled by some heavy weight before he sighed and nodded ever so slightly. Chapter 114 Fassbinder cleared his throat and said, He, your father, had heard rumors, just as I had heard rumors of the secret crematoriums we were running where the bodies of the disappeared were being taken. Your father made a personal investigation. He found some truth and more rumors. But it was enough to shake him, and Conrad Frommer was largely an unshakable man. He offered you no concrete proof? Maddie asked. Fassbinder looked at her as if she were naive and laughed. Concrete? Frau Engel, there was nothing concrete inside the Ministry for State Security. 
Everything was illusion. Smoke and mirrors, gossip and accusations, outright lies and intricately manufactured half-truths. No one knew that better than Conrad. Why? Dietrich asked. What exactly did my father do in the Stasi? Fassbender's eyebrows rose. He never told you? No, the High Commissar replied. That surprised the old man even more. You honestly have no idea. None. Fassbender laughed again, this time in some bewilderment at the mystery that had been Dietrich's father. Then he leaned forward conspiratorially, and in a voice that Maddie had to strain to hear, he said, Your father was a good policeman, Hans, an excellent detective like you. He was so good, however, that he was chosen to work behind the scenes on secret investigations for Milka. He was one of Milka's get-things-done men. Milka? Dietrich cried. You mean Erich Milka, head of the Stasi? I said your father was talented, Fassbinder replied, as if the High Commissar were an imbecile. Conrad worked for him directly on projects vital to Milka's personal agenda. Although Maddie was shocked and fascinated by this revelation, she asked, But what about the slaughterhouse? What about Falk? Tell us what the High Commissar's father told you. The old man turned grim. He said that he'd somehow discovered that the slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde was being used as Milka's personal torture chamber, the place people were taken when he absolutely wanted to know their secrets. And Falk was the torturer? And executioner, as I understand it now, Fassbinder said. Over the course of the next half hour, the old Stasi told them what he knew, the fact the rumor, and the conjecture. Dietrich's father never mentioned Falk's first name, or if he did, Fassbender did not remember it. Falk's father ran the abattoir for the state in the 60s and 70s. The boy grew up working in the slaughterhouse and was said to be very close to his mother. When Falk was 10, however, his mother was arrested, charged with crimes against the state, and taken to Hohenschönhausen prison. She was a makeup artist with the German state opera, who had become involved in the Underground Railroad, helping East Germans escape into the West, a crime considered high treason at the time. The younger Falk was said to be extremely smart. He read all the time and excelled in school. But soon after his mother's imprisonment, for whatever reason, he discovered that he enjoyed killing the animals coming in to slaughter. Maddie squinted one eye, saying, And what? Milka recognized that part of him and encouraged it? You're asking me to explain a paranoid, mad genius, Frau Engel. I can't claim to know Erich Milka's mind or how he came to know of Falk. But however it happened, the High Commissar's father told me that the boy was enlisted into Milka's private army shortly after the slaughterhouse was closed as an abattoir in the late 1970s. Chapter 115 Dietrich watched the old Stasi take a deep draw off his vodka and asked, How long was it used as a torture chamber? I don't know that either, Fassbinder replied. But certainly until your father got wind of it, sometime in January or February of 1980. He was frightened to confront Milka. That was what that drunken call you overheard was about. In his mind, the High Commissar could see himself outside his father's bedroom, listening to him rant. It was like yesterday. Why was he so upset? Your father, though a great patriot and party loyalist, refused on principle to engage in character assassination, torture, or murder. He dealt with facts. He confronted Milka with facts and demanded the operation be shut down. It was a very brave thing to do, Hans. It could have gotten your father sent to Hohenschönhausen, or to the slaughterhouse himself. Dietrich was stunned. For so many years, he'd thought of his father in a single, ruthless way, cruel and unprincipled, except for his devotion to the state. And now it turned out that he may have been the one who rescued the motherless children of Weisenhaus 44? 
Was the colonel there that night when they were all brought to the orphanage? Before the high commissar put voice to these thoughts, Matty asked Fassbinder, Why would Milka back down like that? Fassbinder shrugged. I don't know, though I suspect that Conrad must have had something on Milka aside from the slaughterhouse, something that could not be simply found or erased. In any case, he closed the torture chamber and had all paper evidence of it destroyed sometime in the spring of 1980, I'd presume. And Falk? Dietrich asked. Fassbinder's laugh was curt and cruel. They threw him in Hohenschonhausen prison for a few months, and then they retrained him. Retrained him, Maddie said. As what? He was a sadistic psychopath. The old Stasi's lips puckered before he asked, Other than being an executioner, what's the best profession for a man who genuinely enjoys killing? Assassin, Dietrich said. Fassbinder reappraised him. You are as quick as your father, Hans. The rumor was that Milka had Falk trained to be a more perfect killer, one run by the state, or rather, the head of the ministry. That took Dietrich aback. He murdered people for Milka? I didn't think assassination was part of the Stasi playbook. I can't say that he actually carried out killings for Milka, only that he was trained to do so, Fassbinder replied. And then, Maddie pressed, Fassbender shrugged again. We were an institution fueled by suspicions invented by despots. Who could keep track of everything that happened and everyone who was involved in the last few years? Suffice it to say that one day, long before the wall fell, your father discovered that all records concerning Falk had disappeared. Until you walked into this bar tonight, I had not heard one word of Falk since then. He vanished, as many people did when the wall fell. A myth. End of story. Fassbinder's information gelled with much of what Ilona Fry and Kiefer Brown had testified to. But it also raised as many questions as it answered. Dietrich was about to launch into a litany of them when he noticed a reflection in the window behind the old Stasi. Both Dietrich and Maddie twisted in their chairs to find Tom Burkhardt looking at them with a somber expression. There are no records of Falk in the special Stasi archives, he said. I spent most of the day there. We just found that out ourselves, Maddie replied. Burkhart broke into a victorious grin. But there were records in a church not far from the slaughterhouse. I found Falk's baptismal certificate there. I know his first and middle names, and I believe I know exactly where we can find him. Where? Dietrich and Maddie demanded almost in unison. At his art gallery in Charlottenburg. Chapter 116 Less than an hour later, the intense flame of an acetylene torch cut through the iron security gate at the I. M. Ehrlichman Gallery of Fine Art. Police barricades had gone up around the entire block. Special weapons and tactical cripo officers surrounded all exits, including the roof, which was being monitored by a helicopter flying in high winds. Maddie was there with Burkhardt and Dietrich, all suited up in bulletproof armor. To one side, Ilona Fry watched, wrapped in a blanket and trembling in the arms of the former Kiefer Brown. Three-story building. He owns the whole thing, Dr. Gabrielle told them. He claims his residency on the second and third floors above the gallery. The torch died. Burkhardt said, We are go. The SWAT team assaulted the building from front and rear, blowing open the doors with rams and following with stun grenades. They should have saved the explosives and the doors. Matthias Isaac Falk, a.k.a. I. M. Ehrlichman, a.k.a. Isaac Matthias Ehrlichman, was gone. The name switch seemed obvious when you saw it on paper, but Maddie decided she had to admire Burkhardt's clever instinct in making the connection so quickly once he'd seen the baptismal certificate. When they were cleared to go inside, Maddie held a kerchief to her mouth because the air was still acrid from the stun grenades. Falk's gallery was a warren of a shop, crammed wall to wall and floor to ceiling with primitive art, including a huge collection on the walls surrounding his office area that featured masks from every corner of the world. On the second floor, 
High Commissar Dietrich discovered a makeup kit. In the basement garage, he found eight vehicles, including a blue panel van and an impeccably maintained Trabant 601. Maddie made the biggest discovery. When she tried to open a locked, upright filing cabinet behind the gallery desk, she noticed that it rocked oddly. She pushed and twisted the cabinet to the left, and nothing happened. It felt bolted into the ground and to the wall. But when she twisted it to the right, it disengaged and swiveled out along with a piece of the wall. She pulled out a light, drew her pistol, and eased inside, finding herself in a narrow, high-ceilinged passage that ran the length of the outer room. When she'd determined the space was clear of threat, she groped the wall by the door, felt a switch, and turned it on, illuminating a secret gallery behind the gallery. Maddie stood there looking all around, confused at first as to what she was seeing and what it all meant. The walls of the secret gallery were decorated with a loose collage of trinkets, jewelry, and odd pieces of clothes, and toys, newspaper clippings, and purses and wallets, and older and more recent snapshots of people, men and women and children. Mostly children. And suddenly, the collage made sense, and the shock that followed was a blow to her stomach that rocked her mind. Maddie? Burkhart called from outside. You in there? Yes, she managed. Burkhart ducked inside and looked around. What is this? I think it's a trophy room. Chapter 117 High Commissar Dietrich wanted the secret gallery sealed the moment he saw it, which Maddie understood completely. It was a forensics investigator's motherload of information and evidence. Let them see it before you do, Maddie suggested. Who? Dietrich asked. Fry and Kreiner, Maddie said. See if they recognize anything. I think that gallery is a trophy room, but unless someone can identify something in there, it's just somebody's weird obsession. She thought he was going to argue, but then he nodded and said, I suppose it can't hurt. Maddie went outside. There were television trucks at either end of the block and Klieg lights flaring. She found Ilona Fry still standing with Kreiner. She told them what they'd found and asked if they'd be willing to go inside. Kreiner said he did not think he could. The tidal wave of emotions in the past several hours was too much to deal with as it was, though he did say he'd be willing to look at a later time. But Ilona Fry said, I'll go. You sure? Kreiner asked. She nodded, tucked her chin, and walked with Maddie into the main gallery. Her eyes perked up and she looked all around her at the jumble of art as they walked toward the doorway into the secret gallery. But then Ilona Fry stopped suddenly and stared up at the mask collection, her eyes roving all over them and fear building in her carriage. What is it? Maddie asked. They're almost all of monsters, aren't they? Maddie had not noticed before, but it was true. Falk's monsters leered down as Maddie led Ilona inside the secret gallery. Burkhardt, Weigel, and Dietrich watched Ilona as her attention rolled slowly and carefully over the collage on the wall, her mouth open as if in a trance, her fingers passing above the items. Don't touch, Maddie said, following her closely. No, Ilona said. These are haunted things, aren't they? I suppose they are. Ten feet into the gallery, looking at the right wall, Ilona made a little gasp and halted. No. Tears boiled from her eyes as she moaned, No. Chapter 118 The old curling snapshot was thumbtacked to the wall. In it, two girls in bathing suits were leaning up against the legs of a woman in a bathing suit. Beside it, hanging on a chain from a nail, was an open, tarnished silver locket with a tiny photograph inside of a beautiful young woman. Is that you and Ilza at the beach? Maddie asked her. Ilona nodded through her tears. And that's my locket, and my mother. She gave the locket and the picture of her to me when I turned eight. It was her mother's locket. Falk took it from me the night we were brought to the slaughterhouse. She wiped away her tears and reached for the locket with joy and disbelief, saying, 
I haven't seen a picture of her in 30 years. Maddie caught her hand. You can't touch Ilona. Not yet. But you'll have the locket. I promise you. Ilona looked at it longingly and then suddenly appeared exhausted. I need to go home, Maddie, she said in a dull, flat voice. I need to sleep, and we need to be at the clinic early in the morning. Maddie wanted to look further, to see if there was any memento of Chris in the collage, but she checked her watch. It was nearly 10 p.m. Nicholas was already in bed. Aunt C probably was getting ready. Take her home, Dietrich said. There's nothing more you can do here. I'll come with you, Burkhardt said. Maddie said, I don't... You do, he said. Falk is still out there. Maddie gave in because now she was suddenly too tired to argue. She'd done her job. They'd all done their job. They knew who Falk was. They'd exposed his role in the death of Chris and dozens, if not scores, of others. Beyond this, the case was a manhunt and nothing more. They went out the back of Falk's building with Dietrich, who was making sure that Crippo provided Kreiner with protection overnight. Kreiner told Ilona Fry he would contact her soon. Leaving by the rear allowed Maddie, Burkhardt, and Ilona Fry to avoid the media circus at either end of the closed block and to arrive quickly at Maddie's car. Maddie heard thunder rumbling in the distance as she climbed into the passenger seat. She thought to call home, but then was overwhelmed by fatigue. She drowsed in the front seat as Burkhardt navigated them north toward Ernst Reuterplatz and Strasse de Siebzent Nuni, the street that celebrates Berlin's reunification. They were heading east when Maddie's cell phone rang in her pocket. She tugged it out and was surprised to see that Nicholas was calling. What are you doing up? She asked by way of greeting. And why have you and Aunt C not been answering your phones? She heard a clicking on the line, and then a smooth voice purred. Dear Frau Engel, I'm afraid Aunt C is rather tied up at the moment, and Nicholas has been with me since school let out. Such a pleasant young man. We've taken a drive in the country. Why don't you and Alona Fry come out and join us? Book Five, The Visible Man. Chapter One Hundred Nineteen. Stunned and cored through with fear for Nicholas, Maddie whispered, "Falk." Burkhart snatched the phone from her and turned on the speaker just in time to hear Falk say, "An old name." Panic stricken now, Maddie pleaded, "Let him go, please. He's just a boy." Yes, he is, Falk said icily. So listen carefully if you ever want to see him alive again. I want you to get Ilona Fry, and I want you to bring her to me. You and Ilona, no one else. If you do bring someone else, anyone else, I will cut your son's throat, ear to ear, just the way I used to bleed out hogs for my father. Do you understand? Maddie glanced at Burkhardt, who had gone cold and hard at the wheel, slowing, looking for a place to stop. Ilona Fry softly whimpered in the back seat. Burkhardt looked at Ilona, pressed his finger to his lips, and nodded to Maddie. All right, Maddie said shakily. Where do you want me to bring her? Where any mother might have looked for a lost child in the last days of the East German Republic. Falk snarled. You have 90 minutes to get here or your boy dies. That's not enough. It's what you've got, Falk said and hung up. Chapter 120 Racing south as the storm threatened, Maddie stared into the darkness, doing everything in her power not to collapse. In the back seat, Ilona Fry was turning hysterical. You're not going to let him have me, are you? You wouldn't trade me for your son, would you? For a second, Maddie was so stunned at the question that she did not know what to say. But then she shook her head. No. No, of course not. Call the police, Ilona pleaded. That could get Nicholas killed, Burkhart said. Then call your friends at private. 
With Falk's warning about bringing anyone else along still ringing in her ears, she looked to Burkhardt and said, You're the hostage rescuer. What do we do? Is there specialized gear in the trunk? Yes, it's Private's car. Give me the particulars. Maddie struggled to think. Two bulletproof vests, one 9mm Heckler & Coke automatic assault rifle, two 20-shot magazines in 9mm. Night vision? He asked. A scope? No goggles. Just the scope. Radios? Cameras? Two earbuds with Bluetooth mics and two fiber optic units. Can they feed wireless to a website? Private Berlin's. So I could access a feed from my phone? If coverage is good. Describe the layout of the orphanage. Between Maddie and Ilona, they gave it to him. The front entry. The offices on the immediate right. The kitchen. The dining hall. The staircase. The rooms upstairs. The rotting floors. The caved-in roof. Is there a rear entrance? Burkhardt asked. Ilona said there were three. One at the kitchen, and two others at either end of the building that led to back staircases to the upper floors. They passed Halle and headed east. With every mile... Mattie felt more and more on the verge of a nervous breakdown. First her mother, then Chris, and now Nicholas. Though she considered herself spiritual, Mattie was not by nature religious. Still, as they got closer and closer to the ruins of Weisenhaus 44, she found herself praying to God to save her son. He was only a boy. Nine years old, her little boy, her most precious gift. Chapter 121 Burkhardt's first plan called for Ilona Fry to remain behind in the car and call Private and Berlin Crippo while he and Maddie made a rescue attempt. But he'll kill Nicholas if I'm not there, Ilona said. I'll tell him I couldn't find you, Maddie replied. He only gave us 90 minutes. You'll stay in the car. Let Burkhardt and me handle it. Ilona chewed on her knuckle in the back seat. Then she shook her head. No, I won't do that. I've spent my life running from him. It's driven me insane on more than one occasion. If I'm going to have any hope of a life, I have to face him. Tell him what I think of him, what he did to me and the others. And then, honestly, I'd like to see him die. New plan, then, Burkhart said as he slowed to a stop about a mile from the orphanage. We get suited up, and then 500 yards shy of the place... You let me out. You two park on the road, go up the drive, and in the front. I'll follow through the woods and circle round the back. They got out and took the tactical gear from the trunk. Maddie and Ilona Fry put on the bulletproof vests under their jackets. You'll be unprotected, Burkhart, Maddie said. But unseen, Burkhart replied, pulling out the H&K rifle and night vision scope. This guy doesn't know what one invisible man can do to another. Maddie clipped the tiny fiber-optic camera through the buttonhole on her lapel. She did the same with Ilona. Bury the bud, Burkhart said. The mic, too. Maddie pushed the bud deep into her ear and slipped the mic under her wristwatch before climbing in the driver's seat with Ilona as front passenger and Burkhart in the rear. We should call private, Maddie said. Burkhart dialed Jack Morgan's number and explained what was happening. Morgan was furious that they had not contacted him or Crippo earlier. We're trying to save my son's life, Jack, Maddie insisted. We're heading to the airport, Morgan said. We're renting a helicopter. No, Burkhart said. Not unless you can land a mile away. He's smart. He'll know we've called in backup if he hears a chopper. I'll call Dietrich, Morgan replied, and hung up. Maddie put the car in gear and drove. A few silent moments later, Rain began to spatter the windows. Lightning flashed in the distance, but it was enough to reveal the blades of the huge wind turbines spinning in the breeze. It's right up ahead on the left, she said. Five hundred yards. Ready? Burkhardt asked as she slowed to a stop. No. Ilona? Yes. But her response was wrought with doubt and fear. Maddie twisted in her seat when Burkhardt opened the rear door. Please tell me Nicholas is going to be okay. Burkhart put his giant hand on hers as the rain began to pour. He's going to be, Maddie. 
You just have to have faith. Chapter 122 Friends, fellow Berliners, I am standing by a big pine tree in the light rain just inside the woods northeast of the rear entrance to the orphanage. I am wet, but more than pleased, when I hear the crunch of tires as a car pulls off onto the shoulder out on the main road south of Weisenhaus 44. A moment later, I hear a car door open, but no dome light goes on inside. A second door opens. Still no light. It makes me feel that my suspicions were justified. I slip around the back of the pine tree and press myself tightly to it, chilled to the bone, watching that rear entrance, figuring that this will be how the counter-terrorism expert Burkhardt will try to outflank me while Ilona Fry and Matty Engel go through the front door. They'll be scared shitless, I think, and my heart races. A mother, a son, a ghost from my past, their combined fear. Once Burkhart is dealt with, it will be like old times, I decide. One last celebration before I move on. I stay frozen to the tree, waiting after they've gone. One minute, two minutes. At three minutes, I'm starting to think I've overthought things and that I should be moving quickly into the orphanage before they can find Nick. But at three minutes, thirty seconds, I become aware of a change in the darkness in front of me, and then I see it, the subtle dim green glow of some sort of night vision device. I cling tighter to the tree, my pistol in my right hand, aimed toward the glow, but then I lose it. Gone. I peer and peer and see nothing. I'm running out of time. A twig snaps. I slide around the tree, moving the gun toward the sound. I hear a low voice. Go in slow. Let him talk to you first. At thirty yards, a rectangular glow much brighter. He's looking at his cell phone. Horrible time to be texting, I think, and shoot twice. I hear both rounds hit flesh and bone, a gasp, a cough, and then a satisfying crash that soon drowned by the rain pelting the woods. Chapter 123 Burkhardt? Maddie murmured into her mic as they approached the ruins of Weisenhaus 44. She'd heard him gasp and cough. Now all she could make out was static and rain transmitting through the bud. What is it? Ilona whispered. What's wrong? For a second, Maddie didn't know what to do. That gasp. That cough. And then it just didn't matter. Niklas was somewhere inside the ruins of the orphanage. She was going to bring him out of there alive. Alive, she said to herself over and over as she got out her gun and they climbed up onto the porch of the place. Maddie led Alona through the busted front door, past the entrance to what had been Harriet Laidvish's office. When they reached the bottom of the staircase, Maddie called out, Falk! But they heard nothing but the rain and wind. They checked the dining room and the kitchen. Nothing. They returned to the staircase, and again Maddie cried, Falk! Drop the gun, Falk said from the shadows. Toss it behind you. Maddie hesitated. Drop it if you ever want to see your son again. Maddie tossed the pistol back behind her. It clattered away. Flashlight too, Falk said. She complied, and then she saw her shadow and Ilona's on the risers of the old staircase as Falk shined her light on them. Climb, he said, then made that clicking noise in his throat. Ilona panicked at the sound and tried to make a run for it, but Falk grabbed her by the hair and yanked her off her feet. She began to shriek. Scream all you want, Falk snarled. There's no one who can hear you. We're miles from nowhere and we have unfinished business. He glared at Maddie. Get upstairs. Your boy's waiting for you. Maddie climbed up into the darkness with Ilona moaning behind her. 
They reached the landing, and Falk directed them down the hall into a room, which faced the rear of the orphanage, looking out over farmland and woods. His flashlight cut the room, and Maddie thought she saw rope hanging from the exposed beam before the light focused on the floor. Falk told them to kneel. When they had, he instructed them to take off their bulletproof vests and clasp their hands behind their heads. He was behind Maddie the entire time, and she never got a good look at his face. He put zip-tie restraints on their wrists and ankles, and then came around the front of them. In the slanted light of the flashlights brightening the room, Maddie thought that Falk's face and head resembled a wig mannequin's. He was bald, had no eyebrows, and his skin was strangely smooth, with ears tightly pinned back. Don't think you're ever getting out of here, hmm? Falk said. Your friend Burkhart, the big guy? I put two rounds in his chest. He's not going anywhere ever again. Maddie's heart plunged ten stories. Burkhart? Dead? In her mind, she saw him making eggs Burkhart earlier that morning and laughing at one of Niklas's jokes. She felt crazed with fear. Where's my son? Maddie demanded. Falk walked to a door in the corner of the room and pulled out Nicholas, who was in restraints. Duct tape sealed his mouth. Nicky! Maddie yelled. Wall-eyed, Nicholas started whining at his mother. Let him go! Ilona Fry yelled. You've got me! You've got what you want! Falk laughed. And spoil my fun, Ilona? <laughs> I think not. Chapter 124 My friends, fellow Berliners, I light the gas lantern I brought especially for this occasion. You remember the lanterns, don't you, Ilona? I ask. The soft, wavering light where we used to play in the slaughterhouse. Ilona looks hypnotized staring at the lantern, her mouth stretching against some horror playing in her schizophrenic mind before the light inside her seems to click off. She turns her head and stares at the wall, humming a child's tune. You do remember, I say, and click my throat in approval. Then I haul Matty Engel to her feet, walk her backward, and tell her to kneel again, Hands over her head. I feed a steel hook around the restraints. It's attached to a rope that runs through a pulley I've attached to the beam. Stand up, I say, and start pulling out the slack until her arms are stretched tight. I come around her and smile. There, I say. Now that is better, don't you think? Hmm? Let my son go, she says. Please. He's innocent. You two are like an old record, I snap. If it didn't work for Ilona's mother, or Chris's mother, or any of the others, what makes you think it will work for you? What makes you so special? I cross the room to Nicholas and tear the tape from his mouth. Then I return to Matty, get out a utility knife, and use its razor-sharp blade to slit off her blouse and bra. When I'm done, I display her proudly to her son, Nicholas. Then I press the blade to her breast and leer at the boy. You love your mommy, don't you? Chapter 125 Nicholas began to cry in pain and fear for Maddie. Why are you doing this? Maddie felt more than humiliated, her own shame magnified by Nicholas's and she understood why Falk's methods had garnered confessions. She looked him up and down, spotted the excitement in Falk's face and the bulge in his slacks, and remembered what Genevieve the sex worker had told her. Maddie turned livid and shouted, Don't show him anything, Nicholas. He wants to see your fear. Don't give it to him. No matter what happens, don't. Nicholas hesitated, but then clamped his jaw tight and stared back at his mother, nodding with wide and glassy eyes. My brave, brave little boy, Maddie thought. Falk's joy faded. He twisted his lips at Maddie as if she'd spoiled his fun. Then he shrugged. 
That's okay. I enjoy pain, too. He went around behind her and pulled hard on the rope. The plastic restraints sawed into Maddie's wrists and her shoulders popped as she was lifted off the floor. The restraints cut her. She felt like her arms were going to dislocate from their sockets. Maddie had never known such agony. She bit her lip not to scream, doing everything in her power not to show her pain. But finally, as if it were coming from another person, she heard an uncontrolled howl of rage burst from her throat. When Falk came around in front of her, his eyes were lit up like a kid's at an amusement park. Maddie refused to look at him. Instead, she focused on Nicholas, who was backed up against the wall, shaking and crying but trying to stop. Mom! Maddie did not reply. Instead, she took the rage burning in her and channeled it. She arched and kicked at Falk. The tips of her shoes just missed his groin, but hit him hard in his upper thigh. He was somewhat shocked before he laughed with delight. You're only the second one to ever try that. Didn't work the first time, either. Kicking at him had only damaged her wrists more. The pain was excruciating. She saw black spots dance before her eyes and thought she was going to pass out. But then Falk went around behind her, released the rope, and lowered her until she stood on the floor, hands snugged up toward the beam. Mom, you're bleeding, Nicholas cried. Dazed, Maddie looked up. Blood trickled and oozed from her wounds. When Falk came back around to face her, Maddie gasped. You did this to the mothers at the slaughterhouse, hanging them on meat hooks? Got to have some way to move a carcass around. I'm not a carcass. You will be soon enough. He gestured with the knife toward Nicholas, and then pressed the tip against her ribcage just below her breast. That's how they'll find you, your son and Ilona, hanging like carcasses. Chapter 126 Dear friends, I must admit I'm enjoying myself, especially because the drumming of rain on the orphanage has become a comfort, deadening everything, focusing everything on the delights of my final interlude. A mother, a son, an old friend, the anticipation of death. But then I check my watch and say, When exactly do you think they will be here? Who? Maddie asks. I put on one of the bulletproof vests, replying, Whoever you called to come and rescue you. We called no one. We did what you told us, now let us go. Liar, I say. You brought big hair Burkhardt when I told you not to, so you must have told someone else what was going on. We didn't, Maddie says. I'm telling you, we didn't. I stare at her for several long moments. I suppose it's possible, but highly unlikely. I check my watch again. She's been out of her car for roughly twenty minutes. I've got at least twenty more to play before clearing the premises but I want to be sure, and quickly. I go to my pack and find a device I picked up just the other day. I turn around with it in my hand, the tip just showing. I wave it at her. What is that? She says. It's too bad we don't have much time, I say. I do so like to let these things unfold at their leisure. Maddie starts to squirm, and it makes me excited. She has no idea what I've got. Isn't that the big, big fear? The unknown? Human brains can't handle the unknown. Do you know why? Because their imagination always comes up with something worse. At last, I open my hand and show her the device. It was developed for mountaineers who needed to light fires in high winds, I say. They call it a pocket torch. I bought it last week. Handy. I click on the starter. There's a snapping noise and then a thin, intense flame bursts from a tube. 2,400 degrees, I say, enjoying the terror flaring in Maddie's face. The fear of it is primal, isn't it? Fire? 
You know, I've always found that when all else fails, the fear of having an eye melted usually makes people talk. Chapter 127 Thunder broke within several hundred yards of the orphanage, and the lightning flash made the room brighter than day. But all Maddie could see was that evil flame hissing out the nozzle of the pocket torch. No! Nicholas screamed. Don't! Please! Time seemed to slow for Maddie. She was acutely aware of Falk drifting behind her right side where she could not kick at him. She gritted her teeth and twisted her head. Then, like a delirious whisper coming from another dimension, she heard Burkhart talking in her ear. Engel. Maddie. I've been hit twice out behind the orphanage. Left forearm through and through, tourniqueted. Left thigh, broken femur. I've got a belt on it, too. I can't find my cell phone because I can't move, Maddie. I can't come for you and Alona and Nicholas. Burkhart began to choke bitterly. I can't save you. He got hold of himself. If you can hear me, don't give up. Prolong whatever nightmare he's taken you into. Fight! There are people who love you, Maddie. I... I love you. You're beautiful. And brave and smart and tough. And your kid is the greatest. Keep fighting until they can get to you. Keep fighting. Falk grabbed Maddie's chin and twisted her head toward him. She saw the flame, orange and red, and shaped like a fine chisel. It passed her ear, singed her hair, and then stroked her shoulder blade. The pain was indescribable. Maddie jerked away from it. She screamed and screamed again. Mom! Nicholas was hysterical, up on his knees, blubbering. Mommy! I'll ask you once more. Falk said. Who's coming and when? Maddie was shaking and on the verge of vomiting from the smell of her own burned flesh and from the agony she saw painted on her son's face. She heard Burkhart's voice telling her to fight. We called Berlin police before we came in, she gasped. They're coming. No matter what you do to us, they are going to catch you this time, Falk. There was a moment of doubt on Falk's face, but then he grinned. Oh, I'll get away. I always do. They'll probably call Hala Crippo, but they're 25 minutes away at least. Still, I'll have to move up my time schedule. He went to his bag and got out a flathead screwdriver. Deep in her haze of pain, Mattie still knew what that meant. Delay, Burkhart whispered in her ear. Delay! Falk took a step toward Alona, who was still on her knees and facing the wall and humming like a child. How did you do it the first time? Maddie gasped. How did you get your Stasi files and destroy them? How did you get away? Chapter 128 My fellow Berliners, at her question I pause, wanting to ignore her, to finish my business and then leave this place for good. But a part of me wants someone, anyone, to know of my genius. It's irresistible, and besides, when I sit to my work, I am quick and efficient like my father taught me. It was relatively easy, I tell her. By the mid-1980s, I could see clearly that the GDR's time was coming to an end. I could also see that my special talents would not be understood if that came to pass. So I set about erasing myself almost three years before the wall fell. How? A bribe to the right people, a threat to the right people. I got hold of my files, which I burned. I knew Milka was already shredding everything to do with me. So then it was just a matter of waiting until things became destabilized enough. Once I heard about the storming of Stasi headquarters in Leipzig, I knew the time was right. I went out into the streets of East Berlin like everyone else and watched while they knocked the wall down with sledgehammers and cranes. When the crowd surged through in both directions, I went west with fake papers and soon disappeared 
to Africa. I gesture proudly to my face. That's where all this was done, almost a year of work. No one would ever know I was Matthias Falk. I grip the screwdriver and half turn toward Ilona. And the masks? Maddie asks. I can't resist. A childhood interest long dormant. I found a mask there, in Africa, I reply. I began collecting them while I was recuperating. A passion turned into a business. How did you fund all this? Where did the money come from? I grin. That was the first thing that I tortured out of the mothers. I got them to tell me where their family money, jewelry, and silverware were hidden. I had more than enough to do what I had to do. So three years after the wall came down, I flew back to Berlin and started my gallery. And Ilza Fry? Ilona Fry stops humming. Ah, Christoph and Ilsa, I say, truly enjoying the moment. In the FKK, Ilsa recognized my voice. I saw it in her face the moment it happened. I had to take care of her. And Chris? He managed to track me back to Berlin by going to the FKK clubs in the city, asking about a man with masks. No one talked, except one of my regulars who told me. I told her to tell Chris about me. And the shop. Once I knew he was on my tail, I led him to the slaughterhouse and ambushed him. I knew he'd be upset being there, not thinking correctly, especially after seeing the rats on Ilse in the sub-basement. Ilona starts to sob, and my empathetic side understands. You didn't know, Ilona? I say, feeding on her pain. Oh, yes, it's true. Your dear little sister is gone. And now, so are you. I take two steps and grab her by the hair and wrench it upward, revealing the nape of her neck. Ilona's making these squealing noises like a piglet going to slaughter. I cock my arm and prepare to drive the screwdriver up into her little piggy brain. Chapter 129 Stop right there, a male voice shouted from behind Maddie. Drop it and her or by God I'll blow your head off. Falk froze and looked back. Matty twisted around. Derek Eberhardt, the farmer who was tilling the fields by Weisenhaus 44 when Matty first came to the orphanage, was standing in the doorway and looking over the brace of his double-barreled shotgun. Drop it, Eberhardt repeated. I know how to use this weapon, mister. Falk let go of Ilona and dropped the screwdriver. Get on the floor, Matty shouted at Falk. Face fucking down! Hands where he can see them! Falk looked at Maddie in shock, disbelief, and then sullen resentment as he lowered himself to the floor. Horrified, Eberhardt came around Maddie. My God, what's he done to you? He's got a gun, Maddie said. It's over there, and a pocket torch, too. She was watching Falk, who lay on the floor with his fingers entwined behind his head. His body was tense and alert. Got them, Eberhardt said, and she watched him toss the pistol and the torch out the window. Please, Herr Eberhardt, Maddie said. Cut me down. Get us free. Eberhardt pulled out a knife and sliced the restraints from Maddie's wrists, the pain almost as bad as fire. Eberhardt set down the shotgun, shrugged off his raincoat, and gave it to her to cover herself. Thank you, she said as Eberhardt went to free Nicholas. She felt dizzy as if she might faint, then surged with joy at seeing Nicholas cut free. He got up and rushed into her arms. Mommy, he sobbed. Maddie bear-hugged Nicholas to her, tears streaming down her cheeks as she kissed the top of his head. I am so, so sorry you had to... I thought he was going to kill us. No, no, baby, Maddie whispered. Not today. Eberhardt freed Ilona and helped her to her feet. 
She moved drunkenly when she asked Maddie. Did you see her in the slaughterhouse basement? Ilza? Maddie felt gutted. I couldn't tell you. I just didn't have the heart to do it. I had hope, Ilona said in a little girl voice. And now... She wheeled around and kicked viciously at Falk, hitting him in the ribs. You fucking sick bastard! She screamed, going into meltdown. You killed Ilza and Chris and Greta! She kicked him again. You killed our mothers! You made them confess to things they never did! Why? Maddie grabbed her and pulled her away as she continued to shriek. Chapter 130 Lying there on the floor, I can't help my hard wiring. I'm feeling the kicks Ilona gave me, and I'm loving the painful throb. And I'm hearing the pain in her voice, and I'm loving life all the more. Why, I say with a grin, because I like it, Ilona. I like to be there when the lights go out. And I like making them go out even more. I like to be there when the life drains out of them. I like to feel, smell, taste, and hear death. It's as simple as that. Always has been. Cow, pig, mother, child, it's all the same to me. The farmer is circling to my left. I can see his rubber boots in my peripheral vision. What kind of animal are you? He demands. A predator, I reply. Didn't you know? Killing is in our nature. Eberhard takes a step toward me, as if he is going to kick me too. But then, over the sound of the rain, I hear sirens in the distance. The farmer stops. He hears them too. He takes several careful steps backward away from me. Cracking, splintering, the floor beneath his left rubber boot collapses. He breaks through up to his thigh and is wrenched violently backward. I'm up and moving even before I realize he's dropped the shotgun. I take two quick steps and kick him right on the point of the chin. Eberhardt's head snaps back out cold. I spin looking for Maddie. But she's already on me. She smashes me in the ribs with a piece of wood. It stuns me. I go to my knees. She steps up to hit me again. But I drop into a sitting position and lash out with my foot, connecting with her ankle. She buckles and falls. I roll to my feet and kick her in the stomach. I hear all the wind go out of her. The sirens are closer now. I can hear them wailing. I look at Maddie Engel. Time for just one more, I'd say. I can see she doesn't understand. But then I grab little Nicky by the neck. I lift him, choking, and drag him back toward my screwdriver lying there on the floor. I throw him down. I grab the tool and then headlock the screaming little boy, exposing his neck as if it were a lamb's. I look at Maddie, who's struggling to get up. She can't even talk. Show me your eyes! I shout. I want to see them when Nicholas's go dark. Falk! Ilona screeches behind me and to my left. I look over my shoulder and see her, a ghost from my past, sweating, hair crazed, holding Eberhardt's shotgun. Chapter 131 Falk looked at Ilona in amusement. My dear old friend Ilona, this isn't in you, he began, turning toward her as Nicholas scrambled away. It is in me, Ilona screamed at him. It was in Chris and Ilza and Arthur and Greta and Kiefer, and all of them are in me now. They're in me, Falk. I can hear them calling to me, every one of them. Don't, Maddie cried but Ilona yanked the trigger. Twelve-gauge buckshot hit Falk and hurled him backward. He slammed off the wall and slid down, bleeding only slightly from his wounds to his face and neck. Falk looked down at the bulletproof vest, which had taken the brunt of the blast. He started to laugh. Don't you know? 
You can't kill what you can't see? He looked up at Ilona, who now stood at point-blank range, aiming at his face. What are you going to do? He asked, his amusement deepening. Shoot me in cold blood. Become a person like me. Go to jail because of me. Ilona appeared on the verge of dissolving. Maddie thought to try to wrestle the gun from her. But then Ilona laughed with bitter delight and called to Falk the way a mother might to a child. I'm insane, remember? No one would ever convict me. Lights out time, Falk. Lights out for you. Forever. My friend, Falk began in a begging tone. My, my fellow Berliner. Sirens came into the orphanage yard. Blue and red lights flashed through the open windows. And Maddie caught a split second of Falk stripped of disguise. A naughty little boy caught red-handed before Ilona's shotgun roared. Epilogue. A Beautiful City of Scars. Chapter 132. Three months later, just before Christmas, in memory of Chris Schneider and the other victims of Matthias Falk, the employees of Private Berlin and friends gathered at Gethsemane Church in the Prenzlauerberg neighborhood of East Berlin. In 1989, the church had been a center of the opposition, and Maddie had felt it appropriate that the last victims of the Stasi be memorialized there. There were blown up pictures of Chris and the others arrayed in a semicircle at the front of the church. Jack Morgan was one of the mourners. He sat with Maddie and Nicholas, who held Socrates in his lap. Aunt Cecilia, who'd been found knocked out and tied up in their apartment, told Nicholas to stop fidgeting. Behind them, Ilona Fry sat with Gerhard Kreiner, who testified so courageously on her behalf at the public inquest. Inspector Weigel and High Commissar Dietrich, who was still serving his suspension, were across the aisle. Behind them and in the aisle in a wheelchair, Harriet Ledvish dabbed at her eyes, looking at the photographs of the people the children of Weisenhaus 44 had become. Just before the service began, an older, bent-over man in a dark suit entered the church in a slow shuffle and sat several rows back by himself, his hands resting on a cane. The minister began the simple ceremony talking of the burdens some are called to endure in life and spoke of the victims of Matthias Falk as innocent heroes forced to confront the deepest madness of the East German Republic. Then one by one, mourners rose to talk. Morgan spoke once again about how great and fearless an investigator Christoph Schneider was, one of the best private had ever seen. Daniel Brecht talked of Chris's courage and crazy sense of humor. Dr. Gabriel spoke of Chris's professionalism and his refusal to be compromised, calling him the younger brother he never had. Katerina Doric recalled Chris's true happiness with Maddie and Nicholas. Ilona Fry stood shakily and said, Chris died trying to save my sister and trying to avenge the children of Weisenhaus 44. I'll never forget him. Nor will I forget the other orphans who died at Falk's hands. As horrible as it was, because of them, I feel like I got my sanity back. At last, it was Maddie's turn to stand and express her feelings. Chapter 133 For a second, Maddie did not know if she could do it, but then she looked down at Nicholas and found renewed strength. She got up and described the first time she and Chris met. She made the mourners laugh at his awkwardness when he'd asked her out on their first date, she told them about the joy that surrounded her when he asked her to marry him. Then a somber expression came to her face, and she talked about the emptiness she always felt in him, the dark, hollow part. She also talked about the reaction to the whole story coming out in the press, the slaughterhouse, the bodies, the orphans, the murders, and Falk's Stasi past. Over 20 years have passed since the wall fell, and what happened here in East Berlin has not left many of us, she said. People say we should forget what the secret police did to their fellow citizens. They say we should forget the culture of paranoia and brutality it promoted. They say we should forget what happened to people like Chris and Ilza and you, Ilona. 
We should move on, they say. Move on. Tears welled in Maddie's eyes. Yes, we should move on. Life is for the living. But we can't forget that people like Matthias Falk existed and thrived in a darker world we only left behind two decades ago. And most of all, we can't forget the good people Falk destroyed. They were real. They laughed and cried and cared for each other. They were children and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and wives and lovers. For a second, Maddie felt her entire body trembling with loss. But then, with a bittersweet smile, she pointed in the direction of the old man with the cane. In that vein, I'd like to introduce August Wolfe, she said. For the past 18 years, Herr Wolfe has been a professor of literature at the University of Leipzig. For 15 years before he took that position, he was in and out of Stasi prisons and torture chambers because of positions he took in the mid-1970s regarding the secret police and intellectual freedom. Maddie walked down the aisle and extended her hand. The old man took it and struggled to his feet. Maddie patted his arm and told the mourners, this is also Chris's father. For a moment, there was stunned silence. Finally, High Commissar Dietrich began to clap. And then everyone was on their feet and clapping. Chris's father was overcome for several moments. Then, in the sure voice of a professor, he said, I thought Chris had died with my wife 30 years ago. It's what I was told happened, and there were no records. I had come to peace with my loss ten years before the wall fell. He shook his head. And then to hear that Chris lived and became a good man? He shook his head again, tears streaming down his face. It's almost too much to bear. When Matty found me last week and told me, I didn't believe her at first, he went on. And then I became very bitter at the fact that I hadn't just lost an eight-year-old boy. I'd lost the man he'd become, he sighed. But now, listening to you all describe him, he choked. It was a great, great help to me, an easing of my heartache. I want to thank you for being his friends all these years. Thank you from the bottom of my soul for what you all did to help my son and avenge his death. Chapter 134 There wasn't a dry eye in Gethsemane Church when Maddie threw her arms around August Wolfe. When she broke from his embrace, she looked around and said, I know this is a house of God, but those of us who knew Chris well knew that he loved beer. We have it and plenty of his favorite foods at a restaurant down the street. Let's no longer talk of Chris's death or the death of any of Falk's victims. Instead, I invite you to raise a glass to them and tell more stories about them and keep them alive in our hearts. The minister ended the ceremony and the mourners began to file out. Morgan went to Chris's father, introduced himself, and offered to help the older man outside. Doruk wheeled Frau Leidwisch. Matty trailed Brecht and Dr. Gabriel, with one hand on Niklas's shoulder and the other holding Aunt Cecilia's hand. When they reached the rear of the church off the lobby, she told her son and aunt to go on ahead. She'd be right out. They smiled knowingly and left. Maddie turned and looked at Tom Burkhart, who leaned against the back wall of the church on crutches. His left forearm was wrapped in a bandage. His left leg was casted hip to ankle. Did I do good? She asked. Did I do Chris justice? You did better than good, Burkhart replied. You had me bawling back here. Me. Maddie smiled. You're deeper than you let on, Burkhart. Don't tell anyone, it'll screw up my image. She gazed at him for a long moment. Did you know you were transmitting that night at Weisenhaus 44? Burkhart was genuinely puzzled. Transmitting? I could hear you talking to me after Falk shot you. She paused. I heard everything you said to me, Tom. Burkhart's eyebrows knitted, and he looked away, flushing. That right? Everything? 
Every single word, Maddie said, and smiled again. Burkhart grinned back at her. So? Maddie put her hand on his. So we move on, Burkhart. But we go slowly. Like so many Berliners, we've still got a lot of healing to do. Acknowledgements. We would like to thank the Berliners, native and adopted, who patiently took us through the city and helped us to understand its loss, its triumphs, and its living scars. A great thanks goes to Claudia Elletok with the Berlin Criminal Polizei for her time and candid insight regarding homicide investigations before and after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Guide Philipp Strautmann was a world of information about all things Berlin, from architecture to squatters to slaughterhouses. He also helped us grasp the terror of the divided city and to appreciate the amazing courage of the people who fought to end that terror. We are grateful to Fulbright scholar Nicholas Sullivan, who helped us negotiate the labyrinth of the German Federal Archives. Thanks go as well to mountain bike guide Carissa Champlin, who led us along the ruins of the wall and into Treptower Park, dramatically altering the dimensions of this story. Berlin primitive mask expert Peter Beller was kind enough to let us tour his shop and patiently answered our questions. Any mistakes or mischaracterizations of time, place, or events are our own. This has been a Hachette audio production of Private Berlin, written by James Patterson and Mark Sullivan, read by Ari Fliakos and January Lavoie, executive producer Michelle McGonigal, produced and directed by Scott Sherritt, recorded by Jeff Malinowski and Jared O'Connell, post production by Danny Meltzer, music by Freddie Kaw. Private Berlin is also available in print and as an e-book from Little Brown and Company, a division of Hachette Book Group. Text copyright 2012 by James Patterson. Audio production copyright 2012 by Hachette Audio. All rights reserved. In accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, the duplicating, uploading, and electronic sharing of any part of this audiobook without the permission of the publisher is unlawful piracy and theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like to use material from the audiobook, other than for review purposes, prior written permission must be obtained by contacting the publisher at permissions at hbgusa.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental. <laughs>